Bear Cat Bounce Podcast back at it again. Happy Tuesday yet again. That's right. First Tuesday of 2024 Tuesday and a Tuesday following another win for the basketball team. In the final game of the non-conference slate. Another Tuesday as well. The football team is just closer to the beginning of preparation for season two under Scott Satterfield. And finally, it's another Tuesday after a holiday meaning it is another crossover with George of the Jungle normally on Tuesdays. So without further ado, let's bring in yet again another special guest of my guys, Aaron Smith, Chad Brettel, George Bogle. Great guys, gentlemen, Happy New Year. How are we? Happy New right. Year. Cheers. There's no getting out of next Monday night. I know. I We just got to move we it up. We don't have a choice. We no, we don't. Then They're starting I, the I game at seven thirty. Royer might need to be the be the head man on on that. I gotta watch. Gotta watch that game. It's no, you it, don't. How great you, were you those have, games last night? You have a job. You have to work. How great were those games last night? They were great. Awesome, yes. start to finish. Which it, makes it, me it, like, it, if, if I were on the committee, I would have held out for Florida State, and now I'm glad I wasn't on the committee. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Well, I, well, that would have been a now, different Florida State team that took the field. But no, it totally would have. I mean, yeah, that's a whole nother deal. But um, those matchups were tremendous. Tremendous. Great. It's a lot of fun. Awesome games. And now on a on a sports podcast, we have the knowledge of that of those games because we watched them from beginning to end. Chad, you see you see what I'm doing here? Come yeah, on, it's not now. happening. Eight o'clock Monday night, BBP. <laughs> Miss <the> National <laughs> Champion. Come on. Five o'clock start next Monday. BBP, no. get in here. Excitement. Lock it in. Have a job. Watch the championship game. You got you got to pick. Oh, man. Oh, Why don't you just make it a special post-game edition, and then you can start at midnight or later. Yeah. I, well, they, they are no, kicking no. off. They changed it, George. 7.30 kickoff. Oh, so good. The 9 o'clock kickoff oh. is out. It's a 7.30 kick. Off. Yeah. Sorry about the West Coasters, but my God, that was just ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, we'll be we'll be in and out. You know, set, five o'clock start. We'll be we'll be done before. Pre Brent, there is no but, five uh, o'clock start. This is this has been one great start to the BBP George and the Jungle crossover <laughs> here on this beautiful Tuesday night. So I guess Chad, how are we? How was the new year? How how was the weekend? What's going on? New, New Year was good. Went to uh, went to a friend's house. We uh, we smoked a seven pound beef tenderloin. Okay. And then did some uh, fondant potatoes and some mac and cheese. Had all kinds of desserts. Some Dixie chili dip. Uh, it was good. It was good. Very good. Terrible. I mean, have you ever done uh, Texas shotgun shells? Yes. Yes. With the for the first time jalapeno wrapped. Yeah. Uh, no, the the manicotti. Stuff the manicotti. Oh, you stuff it in. Okay. And then you wrap it in bacon and you smoke it and then hit it with barbecue sauce at the end. It's like a sausage, cheese, beef mixture that you put in the middle. That it's very sounds awesome. Highly it's the first awesome. time I've done them and everybody had declared that, Chad, these are now... Uh, a regular in the party rotation because I was gonna do. I was gonna do. I was gonna do the jalapenos, and uh, you know, just fill them with cream cheese and then wrap them in bacon, a little brown sugar. There were no. There literally was not a single jalapeno at the Independence Kroger. Wow. So I was like, well, I guess I gotta come up with something else. We did Aldi should have gone to Aldi. Maybe that that might have worked that time. I don't go into Aldi because I don't carry any money and I won't be able to get a cart. I don't have jalapenos. Are, they, they sell them by the bag. Oh. You just walk in and get the bag of jalapenos. There's like 12, 15 of them in a bag and then you walk out. Do you, do you have to pay for the bag too? Yeah. I mean, it's like two or three bucks, but you, you get a bag of jalapenos. It was an <laughs> Aldi. Piece thing. I don't think you really caught on to it. He but didn't. it's fine. <laughs> but anyway. That's, that sounds like a good one. I think we need to try these 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 Texas shotgun shells sometimes. They, they were tasty. Nice. Well, George, tasty. first off, awesome glass you're you're sipping out of there. We were talking about it a little bit. Uh, There's a golf ball stuck in it. Yeah, 
That's, time, that's it's you. not a pro V1, though. <laughs> it's a true feel, which I like playing those. Okay. Well, I don't think go. I can get this out of here. I've been trying since I, this ended up. Uh, this is a Christmas gift from a father in law who thinks you're a shitty golfer. That's what this is. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Well, well, how are we, though? How was the. Doing how was good. Your, uh, Great. You wouldn't yeah. believe what I did New Year's Eve. Um, popped a cork on champagne and watched football. That was about it. It was laid back, and then, and and that's how it's been. When I was at work, I would always work New Year's Eve because, you know, you're a married guy, you're older. It's not you let the kids go have fun and party. Right. Let them go out right. with all the amateurs out there on New Year's Eve. So did would, you watch? Did I watch what the ball drop? Brent. No, Brent, did you watch? You should know what I mean by now. Did I watch? Yeah. I don't think I watched, if I don't know what you mean by that. You didn't see Game Henge? No. Oh, entire second set and the first half of the encore. Oh. At MSG. Was, they, did, they did Game Henge. Oh, wow. It's the first time they've done it since the 90s, and they actually, it was like the rock opera version. Where they had like the the actors and the the multi beast and the okay. lizards. There were lizards on stage for a while. It was pretty wild. I need to watch it. I I've been kind of dialed out, traveling, getting back, partying. That's one of my best. Of... My best friend every year. That's what him and his wife do. Is they watch the the New Year's Eve show from MSG. Oh, they do. And yeah, yeah. so we turned it on, and it was Game Henge, and everybody was like, "What the." It was awesome. It just reminded me of what I did on New Year's Eve. I forgot, like after midnight, and I'm like, okay, I've had enough of the, you know, the New Year's show. Right. Uh, I had enough of that at eight o'clock, to be honest. But um, I, I found Spinal Tap. You guys don't know what that is. Oh yeah, I do. Yeah. I do. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Oh yeah. Great. Yeah. Great yeah, that was on, and I'm like, oh my god, I haven't seen this in 30 years. So I watched it, laughed my ass off, and what reminded me was the game hinge. I forgot about the Stonehenge thing where they yeah. were supposed to so, have size Stonehenge uh, yeah. rock formations, and it was 18 inches tall because that's what the, the, the dude put on the neck. It was funny. If you see what I'm talking about, if not, I can't explain it. But that's you're at I'm least saying. somewhat you're at least somewhat familiar with fish, right, George? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So Trey Anastasia, when he was in college in the mid 80s wrote a rock opera okay and they've only done it live like twice in 40 years oh wow yeah and, i and read it, it right now wow so that's what was going on because yeah i've heard that story um I, in fact i just heard it uh one of the radio people I listen to streaming, they always have this uh, fish podcast thing they're pitching. Okay. They talked about that last week. I didn't know about they did it. it. I know about fish and I, I've heard some stuff, but I never really got into it. It wasn't my cup of tea, but. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, it's just. Obviously, there's a big following. First time there since 94. A, yeah. First time since 94, and they've never done it like they did it. Like they they played it, but they didn't have all the theatrics. And Trey's mom was the narrator. Trey's mom was the narrator, and would come out in between songs and narrate the story. Like you should you should see the multi beast. <laughs> they walked the, like a giant like ninety foot multi beast. They walked it through the crowd and up onto the stage. Oh gosh! And they did this yeah. at MFG. At yeah, Square. every year. Every year they do like a four or five night run at MSG leading up like to week long, New Year's. yeah, yeah. My, that's a buddy's there, but that. they don't do the opera. But they did that. No, they've never. They does the they, opera suck? Why don't they? No, do it's it? so they play a bunch of songs from it, like scattered throughout. But they've just never like done it. Okay, so like. Everybody knows all the songs. Like my favorite song from Fish is one of the songs from the from Game Hinge. But they just never like I don't know. I guess it became a thing that they hadn't done it, so they just weren't gonna do it. And then sat Sunday night they rocked it out. It I awesome. got this question about fish, and then we better move on. 
Um, yeah. they have a song <laughs> that's like under 10 minutes long? Uh, a couple. Well, they okay. have a lot of studio versions that are under 10 minutes long. Okay, I was just but, curious because I'd go out with a friend of mine that was in the fish and he would put a fish song on the jukebox and it's like 40 minutes later, I'd be like, is this thing ever in? <laughs> like, God dang, can I hear some Led Zepp or something? They all mold together, George. They all Apparently. mold together. Just jam away. That's what do you think about this topic? Jam away. God, I couldn't tell no, us. I, uh, well, one last thing. Did, so we you tried could. to actually get – we tried to get tickets to the Sphere. Like, you know, waited in the waiting room, wait list, waited, you know, tried to do the little – the lottery thing. And, oh, my gosh, the, the place sold out immediately. Now tickets are going yeah. for, like, 4000 bucks. For one ticket, it's just like oh, George. They're know. doing um, they're doing a four night run at a uh, all inclusive resort in Mexico in February. Oh wow! Yeah, the Maya Riviera, and to go to the show, I had to book the resort. That's how you got your tickets. So it's just going to be for the people that are at this resort. It's like its own private fish show, which I bet I checked into it. Man, some of the villas had their own, like the little walkout pools, like their yeah. own little private pool. Yeah. I was like, boy, that would be the way to do it. <laughs> I got a group, a group of buddies that literally that's all they do. They like make money, save people, money, and go. What's what that? Think about that crowd, though, with right. unlimited drinking and all that. What's this going to look like at six? So, it's going to be a mess. George, you realize that all of those people now are just my age. And like they have real jobs, like eighty percent of them now. I mean, they're responsible on an all-inclusive resort. Oh no, everybody will be wasted. <laughs> have you seen old people on an all-inclusive resort? I have. I, uh, wow. okay. I, I was I was a young person in an all-inclusive resort. Woo! <laughs> like the stories you hear about the villages, everybody down there's got VD or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Not <Sorry>. wrong. <laughs> well, Aaron, how was your new year? Uh <laughs> there was no fish. Okay. Uh it was it was fine. I would be happy to move the conversation along. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> Anything else. Okay. There we go. There we go. Well, yeah. That hey, was one of the that. songs from Game Hinge was famous in the football world, George. What's that? I said one of the songs from Game Hinge was famous in the football world, George. Oh, really? Yeah. Remember the the intro that the Seahawks used to play for Russell Wilson? Yes. Wilson. Yes. Dun -dun, dun -dun. That's fish. That's Game Hinge. They didn't play that in Denver, though. No, they haven't. They haven't adjusted that. Now that now they're telling them. Oh, yeah, what? That that went quicker than I thought it would. I wasn't all sure about that, but then I thought Sean Payton gets there. It's like, okay. Maybe make sure the work. Unlock the key he, he, or unlock the door. He's going to find the key and make Russell Wilson, Russell Wilson again. This yeah. didn't even begin to happen. Yeah, they'll be playing that in Atlanta next year. Something along yeah. those lines. So. But anyway, uh, you know, that's talking fish. That's talking New Year's here on the BBP. Uh, you know, it, and if you are like Aaron, and did you and see the stuff, pictures of Taylor and Travis out on New Year's? Oh yeah, kissing at at midnight. Oh baby, that right there. I got. I missed all that. Uh, now that's that's a Bearcat talk right there. I'm just seeing how much needling I can get on Aaron right. before he just exits the room and calls it a night. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's hanging strong. I admire him for that. Uh, well, you know, it's is that Aaron or Jack Black. <laughs> uh oh. Uh oh. Okay. Aaron's still here. Well, Aaron, if you are listening to Taylor Swift in the car, maybe a little fish, you know, or if you're just shaking you know, it traveling, off, traveling from one side of, of Ohio to the other, and, you know, you, you get a little nicked up, you, you know, you get a little, little, Rough tire, little little nail in the tire. Maybe maybe you need an oil change. My my oil light just came on in my car. I need an oil change. I'm gonna head over to Danco Transmission and Auto Care. Get ten dollars off that oil change or ten percent off that fixing, Aaron. What do you say? Mention mention Aaron Smith. Mention Chad Brendel. Mention George Vogel. George in the jungle. 
Let's them all. Dan Coach Joe will hook you up. Dan Coach Joe will hook you up. So let's talk about Bearcats now. What do you say, guys? That was a oh, real good, quick. Uh, this show reason. is also brought okay. to you by by Remington Tavern. You can find Remington Tavern at eight eight nine two Glenwood Road four five one four zero, where they have daily happy hours from three to seven p.m. Five dollar Woodford Wednesdays. You can find them on Instagram at Remy Tav Cincy. That's R E M. I T A V Cincy with a Y. You can follow them on Facebook. Uh, I believe they have one, at least one more uh, Bengals watch party coming up here on Sunday. So, yeah, the playoff watch parties aren't going to happen. It's true. Not for the Bengals, but the games will be on. There we go. There we go. Remington Tavern, thank you as always. And, uh, Let's 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 dive into it, Chelsea. There will be some more Travis talk later, um, Travis and, and Taylor talk. But uh, talk, go ahead. Thank thank him, Aaron. Good job, Tonk. Thanks for the the first donation of 2024. Uh, yeah. Wow, you did it! You did it. Uh, he said, "Happy New Year's, fellas. It's going to be a great year for growth in the land of Bearcats." Uh, well, it can't go the other way, really. There's not a whole lot of room there. So here we go, Tonky. Good on you. The honky tonk, my man. Uh, so let's dive right into it. Basketball non conference wraps up. It was a victory for the Bearcats as they were able to take down those the pesky aces of Evansville. Uh, 76 58 victory, but one that uh, I tell you what, 76 58. If you watch that first half, you would not think that that would be the final score. Just a, a, a complete, you know, this is very basketball. Matra talk, but it's a tale of two halves to a T. 40 to 32 deficit at the end of a lousy first half for the Bearcats. Second half, they outscore the Purple Aces 44 to 18 to make that final score 76 to 58. Uh, Chad and Aaron, you guys had a nightcap after the game. So I'm gonna I'm I'm just down to George and and just kind of get your your overall thoughts of that game against Evansville, and then we'll, uh, we'll of course, dive in a little bit more. Okay, I will say this. Since Wes Miller got here, he's been preaching what? Defense. Everything begins with defense. And then when he gives up, and, and I'll be honest, I haven't always seen that defense thing coming through and working and being defense first like he preaches. And halftime of that game, I'm sitting there, I'm like, where in the hell – is this defense that this dude's been talking about, and when am I going to see it? And I saw it in the second half. I, <laughs> I can't believe they held another team to under 20 points and a half of basketball, unless, you know, you're doing those old UC Pitt games, you know, where it was a 44-42 final. That wasn't this game. Um, and, and they weren't taking the shot clock down. and all. They played damn good defense in the second half, got very active, Evansville couldn't keep up the pace they had in the first half, shooting the ball and everything else. But I finally saw some good lockdown defense, and it was Evansville. It wasn't a Big 12 team. But at least I saw what he's been talking about since he got to town. And that struck me as a nice positive going into this conference schedule, if, in fact, they can do it against that kind of competition. But at least I saw the mindset of defense first and play off of that. And, you know, to quote a lot of people before me, it was a beautiful thing. It was. Second, the, that second half was was the model for what uh, you would hope defense, of course, as you mentioned, defense first basketball would be. I, you know, it, it was a lot of, you know, Wes mentioned it in the postgame presser, a lot of on-ball defense blocks where you are mano a mano, you're, you're matching up with your guy. Where in the first half, Evansville was hitting those shots. They they were backing down our players, finding finding open cutters, backdoor cuts, and also hitting down some tough shots. But yep, there since I had the entire second half for the most part was in the face, hand hand up every time they shot, and, and getting blocks most of the time. Which I'm one. I'm with you. If they can play that second half defense throughout the Big Twelve, what what Wes said was, you know, I'm not going to guarantee you that we win a lot of games, but I'm going to tell you. We will be in a lot of games, and absolutely they will. In the Big Twelve, that's all you can ask for. Defense like that, yeah, and they've had the rebounding. They've had the rebounding aspect of it, but I haven't seen the defense aspect of it. At least not like I saw in that second half for a complete, you know, twenty-minute half. Um, 
I, I, I was impressed and, and it was good to see. And, and, and if they didn't get blocked, there were a lot of deflections. Uh, there were just a lot of good defensive plays and that's what I want to see. And I, you know, do I want to see 44 to 42 games? No. But do I want to see what I saw in that second half? Hell yeah. We saw enough of those games for, for yeah. years. <laughs> We're, I, I'm we're looking all, forward. They were usually wins. <laughs> right. I, I'm looking forward to uh, getting to to talk to Chris Lepore this week because that's one of the things that that we're planning on helping dissect for people. This is why the defense sucked in the first half, and here are examples. And this is why it was better in the second half in similar sets, similar actions, like. It wasn't oh, like Evansville just changed. Do you uh, think it felt like it, the help defense was there in the second half that I didn't see in the first half. Am I crazy? There was there was better help defense, but you know what the, the most important thing I saw was, George? Guys were getting to spots. Like, the defender was cutting a, a driver off before they got where they wanted to go. Now, some of that is going to be that the help defense was in better place. Right. But – that first half, it was the same problem I had in the Dayton game. They just went – they they could have – I said this to Brent and Keegan at the game. They could have put an X on the floor and said, I'm going there, and UC still couldn't stop them. Right. And right. A, a lot of that is straight up stay in front of your man and don't let him just take you with him wherever he wants Correct. to go. Yeah, You're the not a, was driving me nuts. You're not a dance partner. Correct. You're not out there to do the cha-cha with him. Thank you. Like, you are out there to keep them from getting comfortable, keep yep. them away from their spots. And I saw that. I did. I can cite a couple examples. I know probably exactly what you're talking about, where the help defense was there if the man-to-man -man didn't hold up. But, my God, man, if I had to watch another guy just get exactly where he wanted to get, and take a comfortable, uncontested shot. I was going to throw Keegan down the down the bench. <laughs> well, I would have seen it. I was sitting right. You would have. You're right above me. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Now, so, so I, Chad, I I don't want you to dive too too much into it, but um, I don't. I haven't. Obviously... We haven't done it yet, so I yeah. don't know what he's going to pick. I don't. But that's. Right. I think that's one of the directions, one of the areas that we're going to touch on this week. Right. Uh, well, so, so I, you know, I did rewatch the game um, again today, and, and, and it was just kind of seemed as well in the first half where it, it was similar to when Wes was, was talking about during the Dayton game, how he was trying to throw anything kind of at the wall and see if it stuck, whether it be zone defenses or whether it be, you know, just, just different ways to, to try and defend what the other team was giving them. And then as you mentioned, it felt like in the second half, he said, all right, screw that. We're Cincinnati. They are Evansville. Yes, they, they've come in. They've played well. I, they're missing their top two scores. Guys, let's let's just, you know, man up and, and, and play like you know how to play. And I think that's when they kind of were able to turn the tide in the second half. I feel like they kind of went away from trying to get not, not cute with it, but trying to overthink things and instead just decided to, to – for lack of a better word, nut up and just go out there and, and make it happen. So, and it um, looked like a team that got challenged at halftime in the locker room, even though after the game, Wes didn't even like go anywhere near there. Right. He's asked about, I, I, I don't know what went on and maybe nothing did, but it was a different team and a different mindset on defense. And how many layups and close in looks did they give up in that first half? And, if they gave him up in the second half, there was at least a hand in the face or someone blocking a shot. In the, it was, it was night and day defensively in those two halves. Aaron, your thoughts now? A couple of days removed, obviously. Uh, you're you're a big fan of the dunk. There was a a, a monster dunk at, early in the game, and then yeah, a, a, a missed monster dunk later in the game. That that would have been the dunk of. That would have been the dunk of the year. If we're just we're just day waiting day makes for that dunk. We are waiting for Day Day to throw down one of those monster ones. But I guess you're just overall synopsis. A couple days removed now that uh, taking down Evansville, who you know, they, Evansville showed some things in the first half. You know, they, they had some guys that could 
knock down those mid-range jumpers. You know, when you're down your top two scores, you're going to potentially a lot of people would say, okay, they're going to go in a little bit, ner- not nervous, but kind of feeling a little bit down as if, you know, they're, they're behind the eight ball already. That You didn't sense that at all. They came out. They uh, kind of, kind they of run good met. stuff. Yeah, they did. I, I mean, it was just, it was interesting, but Aaron, your, your thoughts. My thoughts are that this team looked like a team in the first half that deserved to be booed by the home crowd. You were down 32 to 40. You were letting Evansville have their way with you on your own home court. And they, they looked, they looked tired, uninterested. I don't know. I mean, they looked, it was, it was a weird vibe from that team. And they looked like a team that again, just deserved to be booed in the first half. They got their act right the second half. I mean, for Evansville to be missing your top two scores and to be down 40 to 32, it's inexcusable. Um, it's just it's not the brand of basketball that Wes Miller wants this team to have, and it's not the brand of basketball that these fans have come to expect out of Cincinnati. And they they got it right the second half. I hope we don't see another half like that, but I I, I don't know with the Big 12 schedule looming here uh, starting wow. in four days that you're not going to see – at least the level of competition is not going to be Evansville. We do know that much. Um, but I don't know. I just don't want to see a team that just doesn't look all there the first half in another. You know, game. you know what they? You know what I thought they looked like, Aaron? I thought they looked like a team that looked exactly like the fan base looked when they heard that Evansville's top two scores were out. Oh well, this is going to be easy. Like we don't. Yeah. The intensity level isn't necessary tonight. We can. We're coming back from Christmas. It was a New walk, Year's like, it coming like a up. Walkthrough. It shouldn't right, be. That's what I'm getting at. Like yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm saying like they had the same. They clearly had the same reaction to it that we did, because Evansville did a great job hiding it. We had no clue they had their top two guys out until they got, until they walked out of the the locker room for warmups, and one was in a boot and the other was in street clothes, and it was like, oh, huh. Well, I guess this one's going to be a walk in the park. That's exactly how the team played. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I guess uh, the other thing, it still can't be lost that out of all things coming out of this game, that this was the Josh Reed game, right? Like we, we did not expect for the, the hero of this game to kind of put the energy back into this team. And, and that was was Josh Reed. The most consistent player was, was probably Newman. Uh, but Josh Reed was the energy that this team needed. Do you guys feel like at certain times, I, I, I mean, I kind of saw it a lot in, in the latter half of the first half, team kind of falls in love with the three a little bit, tries to maybe ex- extend a lead or or take take a lead by just firing up some some deep balls. I think they attempted 12 in the first half. It, it It's something that kind of, kind of seems to come and go with this team, but it did feel like towards the latter part of that first half, they were just trying to respond with, with, with a three. And, when they started missing those, that was when Evansville went on their run down the stretch. You know, I think it was four minutes past without Cincinnati scoring a point. So it, it felt like sometimes they do just get a little bit too reliant on on firing it up behind the arc. This team will take all year. Yeah, this team will take you. You, you, they've got enough good guys inside, especially now with Reynolds playing. Work the inside first, and then if the outside comes, do that. But it's like it's the opposite. I mean, I, that may be too simplistic, but that's what I – and I definitely – I'm screaming, get the damn – I don't care if you're down 15 in the first half. Get the ball inside. Establish something, and then you can work off that. And that seemed like not – that didn't even enter the thought process in that first half. And if I sound mad, I am. This team will take threes, whether there's a hand in the face, whether they're wide open, whether they are good shots early in the shot clock, late in the shot clock. It doesn't matter. This team is not afraid to shoot a three at any given moment, despite whether it's a a good shot or not. And that's probably the most frustrating thing I I have with this offense. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that second half, they fired up 17, made eight, though. That was kind of the uh, the, the, the whole CMOS, Lukosius second half going off. Right. Right. Yeah. Vicks, a lot Vicks. Of that. Now he took one that he probably shouldn't have, and I think he made it. Um, but those are in rhythm, those are in within the 
you know, they're open. Mm -hmm. They're they're good looks, and they've right. got other Big stuff going on. And it's like it's, when it goes the other way, it just drives me insane. Vix threes killed the spread. Yeah. Well, I was going to get to that. Bill should never shoot another three <laughs> as long as I'm sitting here. God almighty. I was going to get to that. But it, so second half, though, just real fast, I, it, it was a 26 to 6 run to start the second half. Inside of that 26 to 6 run, there was a 15 to 1 run that kind of, you know, also it, it just established the lead and built the lead for the Bearcats. Was that, I, you know, the light flipped on. Uh, and offensively, they kind of fueled themselves with the defensive side of things as well. So I don't know. It's it's putting together two halves uh, that is going to be pinnacle because I, I tell you what, you go to Provo and you and you struggle in the first half. There's not going to be a chance to come back in that second half. Um, I don't know what what do you guys think? We mentioned defense already, but offensively, is it kind of just getting into the flow, getting some stops, and then the confidence builds up because it does it did seem like everyone was kind of moving a lot, a lot more free in the second half there. For me, they play better defense. Yeah. Yeah. For me, it starts with that. And uh, it also starts with getting the ball down. Vic's a good passer. Vic's a good passer out of And I think Reynolds has looked like he finds it. Reynolds can pass. Yeah. 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 Really I, I, so I think that's what they got to do. And and I just think it fits this team so well to, to work inside out and do it that way. They do have some tremendous outside shooters and if that's working roll with it but you know you clang one or two you got i you know you got to get it down there to the guys and both of those guys Vic and jamil both have nice touches um I, I don't know why you would do anything but that but and they're going to have to do that in the big 12 they really are i mean it's going to be a physical tough conference reminds me of when UC went into the Big East and the way that conference was, because back then it was it was the undisputed leader in basketball. Right. Now it looks like the Big Twelve is the mm -hmm. undisputed. When you look at those, it's those really not close rankings and Kim Palm and all that. It's like holy crap, what a gauntlet <laughs> about the run. It's really not close when you compare the the Big Twelve to every other league. Yeah, I mean you you just go right down the list. And see where these guys are, and and what concerns me is, you know, the only teams that you would consider being anywhere near a, a national ranking or anything else, you see, look like crap against in the non-conference, and that's Xavier and Dayton. And I yeah, just neither of them are at home. Me. You do get you do get nine games at home in the Big Twelve, so that's a plus. Uh, and they avoid. The top three, what look like right now, the top three of the top five teams in the league at Fifth Third Arena. That's yeah, not great. And, and, but but if you're trying to win, uh, while it's not great because you're not going to get those marquee ones, what it means is pile most up, of you. the teams at Fifth Third are going to be winnable. Like you don't, you're not trying to beat Kansas at home, which you're probably right. not going to do. Right. So. They're like they they should be able to be more than respectable at Fifth Third Arena. The road games, I'm with you, George. I'm concerned you about what happened somewhere, right? Because you're not going to win them all at home, right? And they yeah, probably you know, they probably that's just how things work and how sports works. But um, there's probably going to be a win that I'm shocked at on the road. Um, but you can't bank on that. You got to bank on the things you're good at. And that's what I hope they embrace as they go into this. And they are going right into the first freaking buzzsaw on Saturday. I mean, that is a buzzsaw out there. Yeah. Just going back to Brent's original question. Um, one of the things I saw in just these, these stats, uh, Cincinnati had 12 points off turnovers in the second half. They had none in the first half. Uh, they had, 10 second chance points, only seven in the first half, 10 in the second, um, and then five fast break points in the second half and none in the first half. So all those things improved in the in the second half. 
that kind of led to the offensive eruption that they were able to have. Defense I leads offense. Positive of, of what you, you just struck on something there, Aaron, that, that the points off turnovers and all that. I love the way this team pushes the ball. And if, if you see Vic get a rebound now in the past, he might start dribbling down the court like a giraffe or something. But now the, these big guys get it to the guard or somebody who can handle the ball. And if it's a guy that can handle the ball, Lukosius or something, they push, they, they push the yeah. hell out of the tempo when they get a rebound. I love that about this team. And uh, that I don't want to see change. I think second half we saw a day-day Thomas that is going to have you competing in the Big 12. If, if he plays with that amount of intensity on the defensive end, and then, you know, aggression on the offensive end as well. You know, you're going to have to take it with a couple of turnovers here and there. And I think with this with this whole team, with, with you, if they get a little too over-aggressive, you're just going to have to stomach some of the turnovers. But, I, you know, I, what I saw at Day Day Thomas had me excited to see as he continues to progress and, you know, first year playing Division One basketball. So, I don't know. I, it's 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 going to be interesting to see if they can put it all together. What's that? We got to get him a headband that stays on. I right? know. How about that? That was so funny when he threw that thing in the crowd, then he went back and the fan gave it. Yeah. <laughs> that thing fell off like three times in that game. <laughs> and uh, so he's uh, that, that's got to be the old one. That's got to be a stretched out old one. Yep. Um, yep. To God, you know, Jordan Brand will have him a new one here soon. <laughs> one of the stats that Telecast brought up, I believe, was – 51 of 59 of Day Day's points had come uh, of the last several games had had come in the second half. And if that that is the actual numbers, if I'm re remembering correctly, we're, we're several days removed and a couple drinking nights in between. Um, but, heavy, heavy. But, but I believe that would translate to uh, 60 of uh, 69 points at this point. Uh, over the course of the last several games, which which is crazy that he's had that kind of second half explosion over the the let last what five six games, but that's where we're at. Well, he looked really good. That's the math major, Aaron Smith. I love it. I love it. But either way, it was a win. Uh, and and you know what? You can you can take wins any way you can get them with with how the whole rest of the landscape around college basketball. It, it does seem like. Most teams are taking one on the chin in the non-conference that they probably should have won. Uh, sadly, Cincinnati didn't win one that they potentially, you know, could have lost, if, if that makes sense. Obviously, the Xavier and the Dayton games. But you headed to, to Big 12 play, 11-2 and two in the non-conference. I'm, I'm going to go around the horn again and, and try just overall thought on how you feel the non-conference was. If, if you want to give it a letter grade, if you want to give, give it a one out of ten, a one out of five balls, you know, th whichever way you want to roll with it. But how you feel through the non-conference slate, the team looked or performed or result-based. Are they looking great, looking okay, could have been better? Just overall synopsis around the horn, Chad. I think the only thing that's that's frustrating is we still don't know what this roster looks like, yeah. like like the whole roster. Like what is what does it look like when you have all eleven guys that are vying for minutes in your rotation available? Because it's happened once, and that was Dayton, and they got their ass kicked. Um, so you don't like what is what is when you need a stop. Who are the guys you need on the floor when when you need to get the when the offense is humming? Who are the guys that are in there? Like what what are what what are your strengths and weaknesses? Like dialed down after thirteen games, and we don't have we don't know we don't we're we're going into the start of Big Twelve play. It feels like with a team that we we don't know a ton about as a unit. We know. I think we've we've seen enough to discern individual players what their strengths and weaknesses can be but i mean i think the number one i think berg wrote about this um in the article he did the number one like most efficient roster has played 44 possessions together that's a little over a half yeah and 
until you can get there, until you're comfortable with this is what our team is, I, I don't know what the ceiling is, right? Like, I, I, we've seen the floor, hopefully. Maybe we haven't. But we don't know what the ceiling is. Like, we... Maybe not. I mean, we're we're going to Kansas. We might see the we might see the floor at Paul Gallon Field House. Um, I hope we have seen the floor, but you're right. We don't know for sure. I mean, that that part is frustrating because you would hope at least even if they didn't play well, we were seeing some continuity and some progression. And it just feels like between the eligibility stuff and then the injury stuff that came. As soon as you got Jamil eligible, Aziz gets hurt three minutes into the UAB or the, the Dayton game. Right. So, and then CJ gets hurt at some point in there as well. And, you know, I don't know. I don't have a great pulse on what this team is yeah. yet. And that's terrifying going into – one of and every team in the Big 12 is going to have one of these five, six game stretches, but there's no six game. Nobody is going to have a harder six game stretch. They're they're going to BYU, to yep. Kansas, and to Baylor. Yep. In the next three weeks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, then all, and then all three of those home games are equally as difficult. <laughs> right. Right. I don't know. So that part, like, some of, there's nothing you can really do about any of it, but that's the circumstance that they've been dealt. Um, I'm just frustrated that, like, I don't have a good feel for when BYU is going to go on a run Saturday night. Yeah. What does it, it does Cincinnati stop it with defense? Does Cincinnati stop it with offense? Like. What what do they do to slow down the inevitable fifteen to two BYU run? It's coming Saturday night. It's coming. Yeah, I you know it, it, it kind of piggybacking off that as well, Chad. You know, it's everyone's been mentioning the rotations and you know the minutes being spread out. You know, and it, you saw Josh Reed as we mentioned have a bulk of the minutes in the second half on on Friday night. Well. Now in your head you're like, okay, well, what happens when Aziz gets added back into the mix? You know, does that lessen the minutes here? How how do we work out the minutes there? What rotation will Josh Reed fit with with, with right. Aziz? And, and and you can't you, you can simulate those in practice, but you can't really go into the game and say, okay, we're going to try out you know a quick five minute spurt with Reed and Aziz on the court together. I, it's it's going to be. I, I don't envy Wes and the staff trying to figure that out on the fly because of, of the poor hand that they've been dealt, but it's going to be tough to, to really see how things mesh un, until you start to really get that gauntlet and, and get the games lined up in front of you. But, you know, I think, I think we did start to see a little bit of a figuring of things out because I, you know, there was some soul searching that happened during the, during the Evansville game and you saw, you know, Odie kind of saw his minutes lessen, uh, to the point where he, he finished with a, a team low of six minutes on in the game. You saw Reed obviously have the big offensive game. That might be, I mean, defensive game. That might be because of matchup scenario, but I don't know. It's it's going to be tough when, when you get those players back and infiltrate them and then figure out the right right combinations. And the fact that we're saying this is, is tough because, you know, the NCAA had a lot to do with it. Now injuries thrown into the mix and things that are just, simply out of the control of a lot of the people. So I'm with you. I'm with you there. You know, a lot of it, though, and, and back to your original question about about assessing this non-conference, and I would say in my mind it's probably C-, minus, um, if, if, if not C-, minus, minus, but you got the Georgia Tech win in there. Uh, the other two, Dayton Xavier, not good. You want all the games you're supposed to win. Uh, the others kind of a that ain't as run. easy as people think it is these days, Georgie. Well, Howard, look at that game on the road. I mean, that was a snake pit, and and they somehow gutted out a win there. 
Um, but I'm still, I expect to beat Howard on the road. I expect to beat Evansville and Stetson and Merrimack at home. You, you expect that. So that's average, right? Um, I, I, but I will say this about Wes's job. This is the kind of team when, when you're trying to figure out rotations and everything, they got nine guys averaging seven and a half points a game or more. Nine. So he's got a lot of stuff to work with, a lot of balls in the air, so to speak. Um, he's got to figure out. He this is why I love the Josh Reed second half against Evansville. Josh Reed got in that game, made a difference. He left him in there. He rolled with the hot hand. That's how this team's got to work, I think. And I know, you know, there's some coaches don't like that. They got to have the sure thing and the sure score and the sure. He's got a bunch of guys that can, different guys that can be hot on a certain night. And you, he's got to figure that out. And I, I joked with Aaron a few weeks ago that this team needs to run a damn scrimmage about four hours before game time and figure out who the hell is having a good game, whose biorhythms are up and whose are down. And that's who you roll with. And he rolled with Josh Reed in that second half, and that kid came through big time. He did so many different things well. Surprised me even because I've always felt like maybe he was a step slow or this or that or something just wasn't quite. He was engaged big time and made a huge difference in that game and in that second half. And I think that's what Wes has got to figure out with all these different – he's got a lot of weapons to use. And it's up to him to figure out who to use when, who's hot on that night, and let him roll with it. And if a guy gets in there and has a really good shift, let him have another one. You know, if he gets gassed, you bring him out, but you get his butt back in there. And that doesn't mean if Day-Day Thomas gets off to a bad start, you bury him on the bench. No, he goes back in. And if you see it starting to work, you know, he can turn it around like he did against Evansville. But I, I think that's the biggest part of Wes's job going into conference play is figuring out who are my guys on this night. Because I got nine of them now that can contribute in a big way. Maybe ten. I'm probably not even counting Josh in there. So he's got ten guys that can contribute in a big way. And so I give a C- minus for the non-conference because you kind of beat everybody you were supposed to. And you didn't beat anyone you weren't supposed to, mm -hmm. um, but I I still think there there's there's a little bit of hope for this team in that they've got so many guys that can step up. It's um, you know we'll see how Wes handles it because what I'm saying is not an easy thing to figure out. Here's the other thing that that I would probably have them in the C range uh, if I was going to to dock them for something major and, and drop it, it would be that it cannot be this easy for the other team's best player. And to have a 20 burger every night. Yeah. Well, but it's not just their, like you can oftentimes Aaron, you can live with one guy like, I, okay, if this guy's going to get 25, that's fine, but we're going to hold the rest of them to 25 and they're only going to score 50. Like mm -hmm. we'll let this guy get his and we'll keep everybody else from getting theirs. I mean, they're giving up 50, 60 to the two best players or or the best player and then, like, a hot secondary guy. Yeah, Teams are getting to that 50 spot, 45, 50 points with two guys. I, and, Chad, it's, that, it's, it's you're, funny. You're going to get murdered in the yeah. Big 12 if, you, if the best player on the other team is going to get 25 and somebody else is going to get 20. Murdered. Well, Murder. Chad, it's funny because we mentioned the top two scores out for Evansville. Well, guess what happened? <laughs> the next two scores on the list both were the leading scores for their for the team this past uh, past weekend. So out was uh, Hume Rikus. I'm not going to try and pronounce that too much. Or <laughs> and Chuck Bailey. So in their replacement, you see Tumi and Kenny Strawbridge. Which also shout out to. Uh, Kenny Strawbridge for making me very sad on a Friday night, knocking down a random, unneeded elbow <laughs> puff fadeaway jumper to take away not only one of my bets, but two of my bets. Had them at 18 and a half, and then I heard the, the other lead score was out, so got it again at 19 and a half, and I felt pretty doggone good. Saw the uh, Daniel Skillings dunk, came out like, okay. 
It's going to be a good Friday. Let's use these winnings towards the weekend. It's going to be a long, fun weekend. And then little did I know. It's going to be a meaningless jumper with 17 seconds left in the game. I I mean, it, it, it was bad. It was bad. But, uh, yeah, um, you saw both of them team together, and it was 17 points for Toomey, 14 points for Strawbridge. Uh, and Toomey was was getting whatever he wanted in the first half, too. So it, it, I agree with you. And, and, and in the Big 12, I, I'll tell you what, BYU's got 10 different guys that can go off. So it's going to be tough. Tough. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. My grade for the first half, um, I'm going to go somewhere in between needs improvement and unsatisfactory. And I only say that just simply based on the fact that I still don't know that we know who even some of the returning guys are in this on this team, whether they're defensive guys, whether they're three-point shooters, whether they're – going to be able to to have a, a big night or not uh I, we don't know how they gel together we don't know i mean we haven't seen the lineups most of the the non-con um and they're they're still trying to figure out how to play with you know jameel and aziz when he gets back and and what they're doing with two bigs at the same time what they're doing with both jizzle and day day out there at the same time um what the only player I feel like is locked in that we know who he is, and that's still something that we're learning on the fly, uh, is that John Newman is going to give you everything he has every single night, and it's going to show up in pretty much every stat line across the board. Yeah. I, you know, we, we have seen efforts out of each each player on the sure. roster where you've seen the flashes where you can say, okay, that will translate into Big 12. I don't think we've seen many times outside of you know some of the blowout wins where two or three or four of the players are doing that at the same time in the same game. So I it got to sp- string that together and got to figure out a, the lineup that works best. So we'll see what happens there. Um, I'm gonna wrap it up real fast, real fast with with this. So last year, who remembers the game across the river at NKU? That was a horrible game. Sorry to, to remind you guys, but that was a loss. Okay, you 100, 160th in Ken Palm. Then two years ago, who remembers that game? Afternoon, Monmouth comes to Fifth Third Arena. It was another loss for the Bearcats. I, it, Hayden Koval tried to fire up a three at the end of the game, I think, to tie it and yeah. went, went off to the <laughs> wayside. side. Uh, just shows you kind of how, how wild it's been, Hayden Koval firing up a three-pointer as the buzzer sounds come we come a long way i guess um and then but there's none of those this year and then you look as well in conference two years ago bearcats lost to temple twice 116th in kempom to finish the season lost to tulsa 171st in kempom to finish that season and then lost to usf 252nd in kempom then last year 120 Temple on the road lost that one on New Year's Day if you remember that, and then ECU dropped that one. ECU was 180th in Kempom last season. I mentioned this because there are no bad losses right now, and the rest of the way there will not be a bad loss. So it's it's tough to, to put it like that in, in layman's terms, but right now 126 West Virginia that's that's the lowest team on Kempom. In the Big 12, they're only going to get higher because if you play teams in the Big 12, you're you're only going to improve your Ken Palm rating, even even through losses. So it'll be it'll be interesting to see what the team can do now with a, a full slate of games where every single game has the opportunity to be one that really helps them out on the resume. But I agree with you guys; it's a uh, a lot of questions that we hope the answers to. We're right there in front of us, but right now they simply are not. Um, let's let's quickly take a look at BYU, and then we'll wrap up this uh, basketball talk. Your guys' overall thoughts on you know opening game in, in the Big Twelve chat. I'm sure you and Dave will dive into this a little bit more. Maybe you and uh, and Chris will also mention it a little bit as well. But I, this this BYU team is something else, man. They uh, 
have had nine different players on their current roster score at least 20 points in a single game this season. That's pretty amazing in my eyes. Their leading scorer, Jackson Robinson, comes off the bench. Yep. They have another player who, who averaged double figures, Spencer Johnson, who is the oldest player in college basketball. They they are returning uh, one of their better players probably this, this weekend, coming off an injury for them, and we'll see if, if he is fully available. But uh, I, I don't want to screw in his name again, but uh, Fuseyini Traor. There you go. Tried it. And he's coming back. From an <laughs> Tried it. <laughs> he's coming back from an injury. So it's it's just another. Uh, this is a good BYU team, but they're similar to, to Cincinnati in, in a way. As no, well. no, uh, no. I, I, I'm talking just wins and losses. So th- they they've won every game that they should have. They had a really good win against San Diego State, and then they lost their only true road game against Utah. Game the the fighting game Massons. Uh, 73 to 69. But the reason why analytics loves them so much is because they they beat the teams that they're supposed to beat by way more than what the analytics think that they, they should beat. They beat the piss out of people. Yeah, they yeah. dominate teams. And here's the thing I mentioned like Utah or, or BYU is going to go on a 15 2 run at some point. Right. They usually go on like three of them every game. Yeah. <laughs> because they have. Numerous guys who can shoot the three. They're, they're the they're best shooting team men. in America. Yeah, two two four men that can step out and knock down threes. They've got a transfer from Charlotte. Chad, I don't know if you've ever seen this guy play for them. Um, yet again, uh, it, it's Ali Khalifa, right? Six yeah, foot I've eleven. This dude, it, so he only averages like five, five, and five. But the way he plays, it's just like it, it's crazy. He he had like a his assist to turnover ratio was seventeen to one. Heading into their last game, I, it's just crazy. He's six foot eleven. They they've got a lot of good players. They d up. They defend the three, and they knock They're down the oldest team in America. Years. Yeah, it'll be it'll be tough sled. Um, so I guess the BYU team. Yes, it is. So question around the around the horn. Now, hold on. I, I do I do want to bring something up though. Yes. This BYU team. Looked a lot like Cincinnati looks right now, one year ago. Okay. Yeah, they did. Returned a lot of a lot of players from last season. What everybody picked them at the bottom of the league. Yeah, thirteen because they were they were what 19, 19 wins last year, nineteen and fifteen. I, I think it might have been fifteen. Let me pull it up real fast. They were in the NIT. Yeah, right. Nineteen and fifteen. There you go. All right. And they won two games in the NIT? Didn't make the NIT. They lost to St. Uh, Mary's okay. in the West Coast Conference Tournament. Okay. Um, but point being, that was a team that was figuring it out. Mm-hmm. A lot of got a lot of lot of roster continuity, a lot of guys figuring things out, playing together. They're huge. Sometimes playing that big, it takes some time to figure out what works and what doesn't, especially defensively. Um, and nobody, nobody saw that team from a year ago who returned almost everybody doing this. It's not, they didn't hit the portal. Right. Like, you, like they built this and right. they are, they are going to be, they're the most fascinating team to me in the big 12 because they are so far over what everybody thought they were going to be, what do they look like after three, four weeks of top teams every night? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, and, and this Treyor guy that they're returning, he's, he was their leading returning scorer from last year. Yeah. Been, out, been out with an injury the last seven games, so you add that to an already turning roster, I, it's just it's a little scary, man. It is absolutely scary. I think What, the only what you hope is yeah. that it that throws off their rhythm a little bit? You would hope, but they he the, he played with the team with these guys all last year, so I know. But I'm saying reintroducing him, right? Like right, sometimes right. there's a game, yeah, where it, it takes right. a game or two to get a guy worked back in. Maybe Let it be Saturday night. Let it be Saturday because night at 10 p.m. <laughs> George, 
You are not going to be happy to hear this. They yeah. are huge. Yeah. And they are going to make you shoot over them. They are not. They I crowd the lane. Jack has to shoot over them. No, but it's going to be very difficult to throw the ball to a post play. Yeah. Well. They pack the lane because they have great length. Like, they have incredible size. So, their belief is we can pack it, and if you spread it, we can close out with our length right. enough to impact you. And right. guess what, George? Cincinnati has shot like one of those like uh, th those college students that comes out with like like twelve yeah. minutes left in the first half, and they're like, "Hey, we'll give you a hundred dollars for every three that you make in ninety seconds." And the kid walks out with a hundred dollars. Right. That's how Cincinnati shot away from home. Well, and I, <laughs> I, I don't think they're going to have CJ this week, are they? Is that no? I, it didn't sound like it today. Um. So that's another option that could get hot. It's not going to be there. Um, but yeah, I still think you got to try to do what I said. And 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 maybe you can against I'm just saying this might not be the game. Right. I, I don't disagree with you. Right. I'm saying but, this uh, is going to be a... Gotta, uh, you still got to have that mentality that we're going to get our shots one way or the other. And, and if it doesn't work out, and hopefully somebody heats up. Hopefully it's... It's freaking Stetson Dan and not Xavier Dan. Um, hopefully, I love that. I I genuinely hope that Stetson Dan sticks around for a long time. Oh yeah, so that we can continue using that in perpetuity. It's funny because it's great. Stetson Are we going to get Stetson Dan? That Stetson Dan or Xavier Dan question last week was really good. I, Peyton uh, Dan, the I've asked about that for a long time. Um, but but Dan probably shouldn't be the one shooting the threes a lot either. But um, I I do I I just I I hope the road thing. No, nobody plays like like you see didn't play a lot of true road. Um, nobody does at the level they're at. Right? Usually they you, you got all those home games and stuff. So hopefully that uh, the the UC road shooting thing. Um, is just a, an aberration because there hasn't been enough data. Hopefully they shoot a lot better on the road. I'm not saying they will. I'm hoping. That's all we can do in 2024, baby. Hope. Hope. Uh, the Marriott Center, they had 18,000 strong in their 30-point win against Wyoming their last game out. Packed the place. It's, it's Provo, supposedly – one of the best environments in college basketball that no one knows about. We're all going to see that on the TV screen at, at, at 10 p.m. You know, they got a big taste of that kind of stuff at Xavier, too, which, back to Chad's point, didn't go well. Didn't go too hot. Aaron, BYU, Cougs. What are you just hoping to see out of the red and black? Life from the beginning of the game to the end of the game. Like, I, I just don't want to see them. I don't know. I mean, you can't have another half like you had against Evansville. I can't, I can't stress that enough. Oh, you can. I mean, you can draft kick, but you can. That's my point though, is you, you can't like you, you, I don't know. I just, I want to see this team fight. I want to see this team look like they, they feel like they have a puncher's chance in any game they play. And right. and whether that lasts throughout, you just can't give up. I, I don't want to see this team get to a half and and maybe they're down twenty and they feel like they're out of it. Like yeah. I, I don't want to see that. I don't want to see. I don't know. I, I, like I said, I just want to see life from the beginning of the game to the end of the game. I, you know, the, the one thing that is kind of crazy is is how elite of a rebounding team the Bearcats have been throughout the non-conference slate. And BYU so, better. I, well, <laughs> right, right now the numbers still say Cincinnati's better. So so there's only two teams that are in the top 13, uh, pardon me, top 12 in both offensive rebound percentage and defensive rebound percentage. That's Cincinnati, who's number one in defensive rebound percentage in the country, and number seven 
in offensive rebound percentage in the country. And that second team is BYU. Number three in offensive rebounding and number 12. Oh, sorry. Number three in defensive rebounding and number 12 in offensive rebounding. So a rebound differential for both teams pretty much it's the same. I yeah. mean, it's, it's right real. now they're the two best rebounding teams in the country, and it's it's not particularly closely, is it, Brent? Arizona's kind of lingering there. Uh, but they kind of dipped a little bit from this past yeah. weekend. But yeah, it's 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 BYU and, and Cincinnati. And BYU shoots a little better from three. No, not a little. Well, a few percentage points, right? They're the number one three point. They're the number one perimeter shooting team in the country. And then I think from the field, they're right around 48, 49, somewhere in there. Yeah. Um, they're good. They're good. I, and when I say 48, 49 percent, they're That's making right. that percentage of right. their shots as a team. Um, it's really scary how well they shoot it. Um, they've got a little to bit get, there. To get to Aaron's point, if you let them play above their ability, they might shoot 80% for a half. Right. Like, if you come out and you don't get after BYU with every inch of scrap that you have in your body, they might they might go 18 for 20 and a half. Well, that's <laughs> as why much as that pains me to say. Like they did in the second half when they yeah. came out against Evansville. I mean, that's, that's how you play winning defense, guys. Yeah. You're you're trying to eat the arm off the other dude. I mean, that's the men that's the mentality you got. Yeah. I I mean they've got four guys, uh BYU does, four guys who are shooting over 41% from three, and each has attempted 48 or more from three. Uh that's just talking amazing. Dalen Hall, 6'4, 41.7% on 48 attempts. Jackson Robinson off the bench, six foot seven. He is shooting 41.4% on 87 attempts. And then, of course, you've got Trevin Neal, who is arguably one of the best shooters in the country, 72 attempts, shooting 43.1. And then Noah Waterman, their 6'11 big guy, has shot 73s, has made 42.9%. So it's a pretty tough. What do you think BYU trash talk sounds like on the court? <laughs> You drank too much coffee this morning. Right, right <laughs> back at you, brother. <laughs> Your girlfriend Take won't want to kiss you after this. Ha <laughs> ha. Jesus loves you. Yeah. I'll that bet works. you, Doctor Pepper. I don't know if Mormons believe in Jesus, so I don't know if that. Works. Um. And uh, anything else on basketball? That's, yeah, that's not how and, Mormon. Yeah, that's yeah. Wrap this one up, man. Well, I hope we see a fight. That's all I know. I hope. Like like a Yancey Gates fight? <laughs> Not quite that far. No, I just oh. want to see a good battle. You hope you see some fight. What you said was, I hope we see a fight. <laughs> I don't know what I said. I, I, did I say a fight? I said, yeah, well, I hope I see the Bearcats fight their butts off. Uh, his golf club, his, his golf ball cup is gone, so he doesn't know what he's doing. It is gone. I was going to go back and it up. Mind? I won't fill it up, but I'll put some in there. What's the next topic um, so I can think about it while I'm getting a drink? Uh, well, I was, was going to just mention the one commit on the football side of things and then roll right into Bengals talk with the George and the Jungle Boys. Okay, I'll be back in a second. Okay. Well, I love that movie. also, I I did want to mention one last thing was uh, oh, well, what was I going to say? Um, I well, yeah, what, one last thing would be why you. I'm I, I'm clinging on to the 95 to 86 neutral court win that they had against NC State. It was only a, a nine point win. NC State hung with them. Can we move the game to somewhere other than BYU? Yeah, I I think it's a little too late to get that planned, but you know what? I'm okay. got to hang on to something. That's so, what scares the like that play. It's going to be their first ever Big Twelve game. Yeah, that is one of the the rowdiest arenas in America. Yeah, like that place. If you give them any reason to get, uh, oh boy, um, excited, right? I'll go with excited. I had to <laughs> remember the subject matter here. Um, th that place is going to go insane. 
So, I agree. and I think the 10 I, p.m. tip, like mm. for for Bearcat fans, would be like, oh, 10 p.m. tip at fifth third, you get rowdy all day. I think that plays a little bit more into BYU's favor because it's like this is what we are going to plan the whole day around. Is this well? And it's only eight o'clock out there. So right, right. But I'm just I, I think kind of kind of lends favor to them, but we'll see. We are going to drink so many decaffeinated coffees before that game. Man. <laughs> wow. Your school has co-ed dorms. <laughs> and said as an insult. <laughs> like, yeah, we do. It's right. fucking great. Thanks. <laughs> oh, boy. Quick paper supply. Yep, that's the quick paper supply timestamp. Your local and family-owned restaurant supply company for all your non-food products. Quick paper services over 150 restaurants with weekly low minimum next day deliveries, providing a wide range of food service products from to-go containers, cups, custom printed products, eco-friendly, and much more. They also have cleaning and restroom supplies for all your janitorial needs. Call Nick, 513-470-2029 and reference Bearcats for 20% off your first month of purchases. Whoa, quick paper supply. Um, just real quick, uh, football-wise, uh, Cameron Wilson uh, transfers from Louisville to Cincinnati, another edge defender, um, outside linebacker type uh, player. You know, it's it's a guy, obviously, that's played under uh, defensive coordinator Brian Brown, a guy who is, is familiar with the staff, familiar with the scheme, and a guy that what I like to see is when players transfer away from uh, you know, teams is it's kind of getting a pulse of what the fan base says about them. And you go on Louisville's board and they're like, ah, this one hurts. You know, Cameron Wilson did everything we needed him to. He's, he, he's a really good piece to a defense and to, to the death of a defense. He, he, he had a really big hit in, in high school tape that I saw. Um, and then he, he was productive in the time that he had at Louisville as well. Um, and then Chad, I think this week should, Probably fire up a little bit more in the portal with, you know, obviously the bulk of the better teams in college football finishing up their seasons uh, this past yeah. week as well. So I imagine more action on that front. Yeah. I mean, there's visits happening the third through the seventh. Um, Keegan has all that pretty much covered on the uh, on the website. So, you know, uh, everything should be. Should be good to go there. Uh, we'll see. Defensive backs, come on down. <laughs> how many, do you know how many they've snagged so far out of the portal? I'm, I'm just – Eight. Eight DBs or eight total? Oh, eight total. Yeah. Uh, DBs, two, just two. Two DBs? Just the yeah, safety DBs. and uh, – Safety and corner. A slot corner and a safety. Yeah, they got to get some more help there. That's nine, the point. Nine total. They coaches. are well aware. Well, oh, we don't count the long snap. They, they saw the games I saw. They're well aware. All He's right, Aaron. Kid too. Yeah, we're just not counting him as a position player because he's a long snapper. Aaron, let's pass right. it on down to George in the jungle. A little, little bangle talk, uh, however rough it was. Uh, now, outside right. of the aforementioned Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey love, Go ahead and take it away from there, Aaron. Well, Aaron, are you okay? Um, no. <laughs> I look. I, I'll be the first to say I did not. I did not want this team to win a game when Joe Burrow went down. I didn't want them to win another game. And then they they played with my hopes, and now now I'm hurt. Now I'm hurt a little bit. Um, <sighs> I hate losing. I don't know. I guess I just feel like with the AFC not having a clear cut winner outside of the Ravens who have dominated everyone at this point um, and the Cleveland Browns that have surprised some people um, both in our division. Um, I, I think that the Dolphins are broads. Uh, they're, they're fast, but I feel like unless they have everybody healthy, they are their front and Bradley Chubb going down hurts them as well. Um, but this was a, a year that the Bengals could have made some noise, and, and especially with the the Chiefs looking like a shell of themselves, uh, barely beating a, a backup quarterback in the Cincinnati Bengals, and taking a, a, a couple generous flags from the 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 refs there, which 
I'm really tired of the referees even being a thing that you almost have to talk about in every game at this point. I side note, I, I miss the days of standard definition when we had no idea if if something actually happened or not. The, the days of 4K and re the, the days of 4K and replay kind of kind of hurt a little bit more than than standard def and granulated <laughs> replay. But uh, yeah, they, they they toyed with my emotions a little bit this year, and the the losses to argue, I don't even know that the disarguable are our biggest foes in the Steelers and the Chiefs at this point sucks. Yeah, it was right there for them. Um, it was totally right there for them. I mean, they did play obviously a lot better than they did against Pittsburgh. Um, but let's. So Pittsburgh can still make the playoffs, right? Not definitely in, can still make. Who in the hell would have taken a bet that the only AFC North team to not make the playoffs would be the Cincinnati Bengals? No, I would no. have everything I got and then some. That would not happen this year. And that very well could happen because I don't think the Ravens are going to need to put up much of a fight against the Steelers. So uh, I think Pittsburgh walks out with a win. But, but this has been – Football's a crazy game. We know that. The individual games are crazy. The seasons are crazy. This has been a crazy freaking season for the Bengals. I mean, you lose Joe Burrow, as Aaron alluded to, you think it's over. They're not going to win again. Then Browning starts looking really, really good. But while Browning starts looking good, you know, that defense started leaking a little bit. And, and you know, it's kind of leaking like a sieve now, even though the Chiefs, didn't pile up a lot of points because, you know, they wheeled Harrison Butker out there five or six times. But, um, you know, the fact that they gave up 130 yards rushing to Isaiah Pacheco, who's a good running back, but you got to stop that. You know, the, the receivers for the Chiefs have not been beating people. Um, and then, you know, the last two minutes and 15 seconds or whatever, Jake Browning gets sacked four times, four times. I think you could have got to him on that series. Um, yeah, well, but it, it's just still crazy that that crap happens. Um, the, the flag, the flag on the intentional. Are you kidding me? The dude was hit when he was throwing the ball. Of course the ball's not going to go where he meant it to. He got clobbered when he's throwing I, I just, there were so many crazy things in that game. Or the... The call on the field that was overturned by the head ref and then had to go to replay to get the call right that was the initial call on the field. But I'll tell you one one call the Bengals could have made that would have been better and, and chopped me up, and it's hindsight's 2020. but I said kick the damn field goal. Kick the field goal. You're in Kansas City. We just saw a game two years ago in right. the AFC Championship where the Chiefs gave up a field goal and decided to get cute at the goal line and ran out of time at the end of the half. And boy, they could have used those three points. You're on the road. You got the Chiefs kind of teetering a little. They're not, they don't have their, they don't have their mojo right now. Get the damn points, go up by six. Things play out from there. Um, I, I didn't like that. I did not like that call at all. I, I I don't mind giving it to Mixon in the fourth and one, but I just don't like the decision to go for it. And I know there's analytics. Say, do this, do that. Sometimes you got, as the head coach, you've got to feel the game and screw analytics. You got to know where you're at. You got to know the flow of the game. You got to know what's going on. Don't just look at a damn chart that says, oh, fourth and one with this much time left in the third quarter and I'm up four or, or three, whatever it was at the point. Um, don't don't look at that. Feel the game. And I think they you kick a field goal there. It's It's not momentum central for the Chiefs. You got three more points on the board, and that fourth and one stop seemed to energize that team, and and that's where I felt like the Bengals. Um, it, it, a lot of things happened in that game, but they kind of screwed it up there. Yeah, the the defense was lackluster um, at, at times as well, giving up a lot of big plays, especially in the second half. Um, when your offense doesn't score any points in the second half, you're probably not going to win. A ton That's of games. another reason you kicked that damn field goal. The Chiefs' defense has been damn good lately. Yeah, uh, you take against a good defense, you take the points wherever you can get them. Um, but yeah, it was it was it was tough sledding. I don't know. I don't know. I, there's there's a lot of holes on this this 
roster as you are coming up quickly on an off season to try and to fill some holes. I feel like they were in a window where Joe was not on his new contract yet this year, as far as salary cap hit, they were in a uh, boom or bust season. I feel like they did not do enough as a front office, as far as roster management goes, uh, especially in regards to the tight end position. Um, the, the punter position has been an abomination for a large part of the season. Um, and just overall depth on this roster, I feel like they, they left a lot of gaps where they, they should have probably taken advantage of the fact that Joe was still on his rookie deal. And your window is, is closed a little bit more than it was next season than it was this season. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm interested to see who we see back at the wide receiver position. Um, you know, do they do they tag T? What do they do? I mean, is Boyd out of here? Um, if I'm, a reader. I'm thinking, my God, I to me, when he's healthy, he's shown enough that if I'm another team, that's a guy I'm going to target if they don't tag him. Um, my guess is they'll probably end up tagging. Um, I, I, it's I been weird when you hear people talk about it around the, the team, George. There seems to be some belief that he he might be done here. Yeah, but they may not tag him. I mean, they may not be able to give him some. Or you other... tag and trade. Yeah. And then they got to do something. I mean, you can't just let the guy walk, right? You wouldn't think. Um, but, yeah. Especially not ha- with how razor thin, the, with how razor thin the margin of error has been with this offense, with Joe Burrow, T. Higgins, and Jamar Chase, when those three guys are on the field. The margins have been razor thin. You let T walk. Right. Woo. No, I know. And, and, you know, it's disappointing, too. And, and early in that game, the offensive line, I felt like, was really playing well. I thought they were winning the line of scrimmage. They were doing well. It just seemed like as the game went on, it was less and less of that. And then, yeah. you know, we saw what happened in the second half. We saw what happened in the last three minutes. And, that's disappointing because they did uh, they did try to make that offensive line whole. And they go out and get Orlando Brown. You know, they kept their faith in Volson at guard. But the year before, you know, you, you get Karras and Kappel. And they, they've done a pretty good job bolstering that line. I don't know that that's paid off as well as it should have, given what they invested, given the track record of these guys, uh, and, and given how crappy – they ran the ball on Sunday. But, again, the Chiefs defense has been playing well. You knew that was probably going to be the case. So that's only to take the three. But um, uh, not that I would belabor that. But I, I just – and then you look at the Bengals' defense to flip it here, giving up seven yards of play to the Chiefs on Sunday. You know, the Bengals have more plays, you know, dominated the clock in the first half like crazy. But when the Chiefs got the ball, it was just bang, 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 bang. And, uh, you know, the Bengals are lucky they didn't get run in that game because when you're wheeling out the field goal kicker and getting in scoring position, they had one punt, one punt in the game that the Bengals forced, if I remember correctly, and I think I do. Um, So the defense is certainly uh, has to share a lot of blame for what's going on here lately as well. I mean, look at Pittsburgh. Do I need to say more? Right. One punt by the Chiefs for 57 yards as opposed to uh, Brad Robbins and his four punts for 190. That dude Look, sucks. look up his net, by the way. That That's dude, he pop. has to go. Like, he has I to know, go. That's he was, at, yeah, he which is – it's crazy because at Michigan he was a damn good punter. What happened? I don't know if they're asking him to do something he didn't do. That I, I don't know. But what – his net was under 40. It was – I don't know what it was Sunday, but it was in the 30s. Um, that's not good, man. That's just not getting it done. You got to do better than that. And all that crap added up to a, a a loss to the Chiefs who are struggling. Yes, it was an arrowhead, but the Bengals are playing for their playoff lives. And you got to find a way to win that game. But but to me, the season kind of died the week before in Pittsburgh, the way they got run. Exactly. You win that Pittsburgh game, you've got a little wiggle room. Like, Correct. 
You're in your right. you're in the driver's seat. You control your own destiny. And they got pumped. Yeah, Mason Rudolph of all people. Pumped. He's a core. I'm like, this is a gift from the football gods. It's Mason Rudolph. And then he goes out and carved them, thanks to George Pickens, who yeah. can't block, but God dang it, he can catch and run. Right. The Pickens blowing up after he got so much black that whole week leading up to it, too. It's just that's typical Cincinnati luck crap like yeah. that. It, right. it is. That just the minute you think somebody, you know, is someone you can take advantage of, they just turn around and kick us right to you know what. And every balls. single sport, every balls, single George, team. in the balls. Just you're right, Chad. Those you've got one in your you got one on your cup, George. Just just say yes, I was yeah, I was giving you I was setting you up. I was setting you up. You teed him up. Oh Aaron. Oh man. I've got a question for you guys. What's the what's the biggest positional need then for the Bengals heading into the offseason? Defensive tackle. Because DJ Reader. DJ Reader is a free agent, and if you're it's using the tag, up to very serious injuries to the same spot. If you're tagging T and trading him, then you lose the tag. And I don't know that I'd tag DJ Reader anyway, despite him being a an amazing locker room guy. He's been Zach. Taylor's you're gonna be able to, look with that injury. You can if you want him back when he's healthy to go, you could probably get him back for. A very reasonable number. I don't think, yeah, you're not going to get him back for the four-year deal that they got him for the first go-round. Uh, that said, I believe Chris Jones is also a free agent at the end of this season. That guy's so good. Um, and, you know, right. Aaron, I, I'm I, I'm trying to think of a way to, to counter what you're saying about the biggest need. Um, but you're probably right. I mean, you, you really are because that's where it begins. And I'm a trench guy. It's like both sides. It, you you got to win that. Uh, it doesn't matter how many Ferraris you have. If you don't have the tanks to clear the path, it doesn't matter how many Ferraris you have. So um, I'm with you on that. Um, I think they kind of whiffed a little bit, although that the, the, the rookie's going to pan out and be damn good. He's already been good. But they kind of whiffed when they went for Nick Scott at the safety position for whatever reason. It just doesn't fit what they do. Yeah. You know, when you lose. Yeah, Battle led led the team in tackles. Yeah. Jordan Battle led the team in tackles. Yeah, this, this really season. played well. Really came in and looks like a, a total keeper. And, and when you lose both starting safeties, and both of those safeties were a big-time part of this team. And, and you think of safeties and it's all about, you know, Past defense, no. These guys were run supporters. They they came up. They made hits. Uh, they made people pay. That that was a big loss, and and I knew it at the time, but I thought they might be able to massage it. And you got Dax Hill stepping in, and 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 that just never quite worked as well as they or anybody else in Cincinnati hoped it would. That's been tough. Uh, some other. Free agents on the defense. Uh, I believe Chidobe Awuzie is also a free agent at the end of this year. Um, I don't know. I don't know how good the Logan Wilson and uh, Jermaine Pratt signings are going to look over the course of, of their new contracts uh, that they're on this year. I, I wasn't impressed. I'm not sure either, but I can tell you this. I, I, I understand the Bengals doing those deals. I agree. I agree. Uh, just – it looked different last week. Last year, it looked like guys playing for a contract. This year, it looked like guys who got paid. And I hope that they find that fire again, both of them. Yeah, they need to. Totally agree. Uh, that said, uh, I don't know. I don't know other big names off the top of my head um, that are also free agents. I know Trey Hendrickson has what one more year left. He's not so, also yeah. a free agent. Yeah, I believe he's got – He they, they just re-up. No, they redid. They extended him in the offseason. Yeah, they okay. just redid. They and, bought another uh, year, whatever. Yeah. And Hubbard, oh, I don't God. think – That guy, whether you pay him or not, he's out there. He's a know, monster. He's hunting. Yeah, he's, he's, he's a key. He's got a, 
he has a chance to lead. He's got a chance to lead the league in sacks next week. Uh, he's tied currently for the lead with uh, Watt in Pittsburgh. But I remember those um, New Orleans telling me he wasn't going to be good because he didn't have the guy on the other side. I yeah, think he's been pretty good. He's he's well. The the guy on the other side's been pretty good as well. I, I wouldn't oh, say no, I'm down in New Orleans. They said the reason. I, I understand. Yeah, I'm just no, saying it, Sam Sam Hubbard playing on the other side of him has, has been. Yeah, above no, average. No, I meant when he was with the Saints. They said the only reason Trey got those sacks is everyone was paying attention to the guy on the other end, and was it, was it made a poor signing. Jordan Cameron, <laughs> I, I think. This. I think it was Jordan Cameron down there on the other side of him. Yeah, uh, or Cameron Jordan or whatever it is. One of those. Yeah. One In any case, two first names. Uh, never trust a guy with two first names. Uh, in any case, um, we'll, we'll see what happens here in the off season. I'm not, again, it, it just, it feels deflating to, to not have hopes and then to have hopes and then to have it all just dashed again. They made it interesting. I, 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 I mean, yes, you wanted them in the playoffs and that's a playoff team to be honest. Um, you lose a guy like Burrow, it, it's, it, you know, and they had the one really bad game, of course, against Pittsburgh when Browning made his first start. But, you know, Browning's beholden to the team next year, but he may have made a, himself some money in the long run here. Um, he's it, it, he's going to stick around as a backup, if nothing else, in this league for a while based on what he did. And I, I love the kid's attitude. I love his attitude. I think he's a, for lack of a better phrase, he's an MFer at that position. I mean, he's he does not back down. I love him. He, he definitely changed my tune in regards to the backup situation here in Cincinnati. Oh. And uh, I, I think you're right. I don't think he's going to struggle to find a job um, whenever his contract ends. Yeah, he's got at least another year at the Bengals, which I don't know how that that way these NFL contracts and these you know practice squad con and how you can sign them for multiple years and they don't hit the market I don't know how that works but he's got to be kind of bummed that it doesn't work in his favor this year yeah but I think essentially the contract he's on the Bengals just have to agree to pay him the league minimum for next year or the veteran minimum bargain. and he's he's stuck that's such a bargain because, I mean, there's a lot of teams that would probably like to bring him in. Sure, but when he signed the deal, there weren't any. Like, no, he I, didn't have a big market at that point. He I got cut by the Vikings. Think it is. It is. But I was just, like, when Minnesota came here and played, I'm like, what would he do on that team, you know, with, yeah. with Jefferson and Addison and Hawkinson, who's out now, but, uh, you know, um, they, they got some weapons, and that, that's a team that if they had him at quarterback right now, and I, I'm not saying, you know, he's the best, but I'm saying he's better than what Minnesota has to go, you know, to take those guys into a potential playoff situation. They would have loved to have him. What do you think the, the coaching staff, if you were to make any changes along the coaching staff, George, uh, do you get rid of anybody going into this offseason? Oh, my goodness. Um, I don't know. I'm sure there will be some changes. If I'm if I'm Zach and I'm looking at it and I'm – I don't know. I, I can't sit here and say for sure I think this guy sucks, that guy sucks. Um, you know, I'm not going to – I don't know. I, I really don't. I think um, – I mean, I think their line coaches have done a good job. I think they've been very, very solid there as opposed to the years they when, – when when you don't have it and then you have it, you need to appreciate it. I, I think they've gotten really good um, line play for the most part. Um, Special teams. I don't know. I, know, I knew you were going to go there. Are you going to – so you're going to launch Darren Simmons – who has been around the block more than once, that ain't going to happen. Now, I know. I know. 
And that guy knows more than either one of us has ever known together. But there, there were no splash plays in the special teams anywhere this season. It's almost like, never mind. I that guy's that. been a proven commodity for 20-plus years in the league. Okay? 20-plus. <laughs> because oh, some rookie right. from Michigan doesn't hit the ball square every time. And, and I'm just saying the guy that went out on the limb for him, I'm sure, right? I'm you're just not saying gonna, special teams. You're not going to hit teams. 100%. Huh? Special teams had a bad year in town in 2023. <laughs> yeah, I, know, I, know, I know some special teams that were probably worse than the Bengals. And they were only a few miles away from Paycor Stadium. So do you just wipe out the coach and say, we got to start over if you're the Bengals? Sometimes a, a <laughs> sometimes fresh air is is a little is is what you need. Well, is oh hey guys, good well, to I'm see you. I'm not close. You were enough. talking about Michigan special teams, right, George? That's what right. you were talking about Michigan special teams, not not the other team in Cincinnati. Just yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, yeah, that's that. we'll we'll go with that. Michigan special teams should have gotten a lot better this year, according to Aaron, because they lost their punter from last year. Yeah, terrible. terrible. <laughs> I told you he was good last year. I don't understand. I don't understand. Well, I don't either, and I'm sure Darren doesn't either, but he'll figure it out. And I guarantee you this, he's if if, if he gets an inkling in the in the offseason workouts and preseason training camp. That it's going to be the same. He is not going to live with it. He's not going to. He's not. I'm sure he's more PO than anybody mm -hmm. about the way the special teams performed and, and, and the punt team performed, and and no returns and all that stuff. Um, but I do believe that he's a guy that grinds and will figure out a way to fix it. And am I a Darren Simmons guy? Yes, I am. So I'm not going to fire him. I believe in him. And I also believe that he will know when he no longer wants to put in the time and grind the way it takes to grind to succeed in that profession, he'll he'll just move on and, you know, go somewhere else and do something else. So that's not a guy I would even consider um, replacing because I respect him that much. But I get it. The, the, the punt team did not do well. But they, you know, you also have to have the personnel when it comes to return guys and all that. And I don't know what's going on there with that team because they've been pretty devoid of it for a while. One last question as we switch gears here before we get into uh, the, the mailbag. Um, I did want to ask you about the Reds here, George, as they made a move for Frankie Montas, a – right-handed starting pitcher one year 16 million dollars signed him away from the yankees he missed almost all of last season uh coming off of shoulder surgery um they look at him as a potential top of the rotation guy and then nick crawl has some comments today that allude to the fact that they are done with free agency splash moves some of us might still be waiting to see a splash move um, compared to the rest of free agency uh, and says that they're probably not going to be trading anybody either. I'm hopeful that it's smoke and mirror talk, but are you, do you feel any certain way about Nick crawl after that move being the, the last move of the off season? Yeah, I heard him say that. Um, and yeah, I think that's kind of smoke because they've got to move a couple players. Probably. There's some stuff they got to do. And maybe when he says that, it's like, all right, we'll move some of these prospects for other prospects. So it's not, you know, a big deal at the major league level. But they, they do have a couple more moves they probably have to make. I'm probably the only guy in town that likes this signing. And I think it goes back to me having Frankie Montas on a fantasy team when he had his good. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I love the guy. And I think that's why I do. Um, it, it's it's a sixteen million 
um, what, 14 this year and then 20 next year if they pick up the option. Frankie, it's a 16 million one year deal. It's a, it's a mutual uh, option, too. So, like, it, it's not one way. But I don't think he can say, I'll take the 20, can he? Well, no, that's mutual. You have to agree. Right. The Reds could say, we want you back, and he could say no. Correct. Correct. Like, they both have to say, my, like, agree to the, to the option. As I sit here right now, my guess is Frankie's getting $16 million out of this <laughs> but, I, but if you look, here's why I like the deal. And $16 million is a lot for a guy who's been injured as much as him and all that stuff. It, it really is. When he's good, he's good. And you look at his strikeout ratio and all, he's really good. It's a good gamble for the Reds to take because right now, all right, you got – Okay, let's throw Frankie in the mix. You got Frankie Montas, Andrew Abbott, Graham Ashcraft, Hunter Green, Nick Lodolo, Nick Martinez, Brandon Williams, and Connor Phillips. That's eight guys going in the spring training who are Connor Phillips you can put on the outside of that maybe, but at least you have viable candidates for a five-man rotation that makes sense. And if Frankie's at the bottom of that, that's fine. I don't care. If Frankie's at the top of that, that's fine. I don't care. If Frankie's not in it, maybe even better because these young guys are are pitching their butts off. And, and maybe you can put Martinez in, in the bullpen role instead of having him as a potential. This this gives them more flexibility. They've got – I know they spent $100 million or whatever it is in free agent con. They got money to burn right now because they're paying the rest of the roster nothing. This no. was, I mean, for the Reds, this deal makes sense. For your average team, maybe not. For them, it does. I, I like the move. Um, I like the fact they went out. He's one of, When he's right, he's one of the better guys left out there as far as the starting pitching candidate, and they went out and got him. Now, are you concerned his best years were dominated by playing in Oakland? Yeah, I'm concerned. And his best performances were in Oakland. Yeah, because he's in a band box now. Yeah, yeah. I'm concerned. Um, and I should have got on uh, my my lovely fan graph site and looked at all his, you know, all the other. He's, he's a good ground. His ground ball rate is pretty good. That's that, sure. that's huge. Yeah. As long as it is. I it, well, George, I tell you what, that's a very intriguing rotation. I like that could be a really good five. If everyone stays healthy, that's my only reserve about, you know, if Frankie can come back fully healthy and then the three of the other four can go a full season or at least a portion, a majority of the season healthy, then yeah, that's a, that's a very intriguing rotation. Yeah. And that's, that's why I like the signing is that they can take that kind of chance. You got to think that out of those guys, you're going to have five healthy ones off and on throughout the season that are going to fill those spots and, and not end up where they were. But who would have predicted last year, you know, you lose Ashcraft. Lodolo never comes back. Mm -hmm. Green was off and on. You you do worry about those guys. But he was, to me, upside-wise, best on the board, and they got him. Um, I, I, I like the move. I was happy when I heard the move. Um, and I think, Aaron, I think when – when, and he didn't phrase it this way, Crawl, but I I mean, I think they're done with the movement and acquisitions when it comes to laying out free agent contracts and bringing – you know, acquiring guys at the major league level that they would bring on payroll. I, I think he'll still make a trade with some of these guys that – I don't, I don't know, what, George. I, I don't think they're what. holding on to – I think they're holding on to capital. You get to the trade deadline, and you you see how many chips you've got uh, at, at the table. And it has proven that the desperate the desperation at the trade deadline brings you a lot more back than what you get in the offseason. Yep. Um, because, you know, everyone's got hope and plans and all that. But when the live fire starts and you're in July – and you start seeing, oh, my God, the Yankees did this. They, okay, we'll give you these prospects for that guy. It makes sense to wait 
until the trade deadline. It really does. I will tell. I don't know. I, I think it was just interesting. I think I think Nick Crawl might need just some some workshop time with a PR professional, um, just working on how to speak to the general public. Again, um, Aaron, but, I hate this. I hate this because we say we want them to be honest. We want them to tell us the truth. We don't want coach speak. We don't want bullshit. And then they they tell you the truth, and you go, "That guy needs some. He needs a PR firm." Somebody unless needs to teach not, him how to coach speak. Unless it's not the truth. Who knows? Aaron, we'll they've out. spent $100 million this offseason. I have questions about how they spent it, but they spent a $100 million this offseason. Season, they are not spending anymore. If it was $100 million going towards this season, that would be one thing. But they didn't spend a, a – I don't know. It's some, that's how you look at it. How do correct. you think Banana Bob looks at it? Well, that's a whole different conversation. Fair. You know what? Uh, I'm sorry, Aaron. I would look at it as Banana Bob does. <laughs> I just spent a hundred million dollars. I just spent a hundred million. And George, especially in baseball, like in football, at least, like I can get out of some of this shit in football. Correct. In baseball, you just spent a hundred million dollars. Yeah, you're there is a hundred million dollars coming out of your bank account when this. You is all said are done. on the hook, and and. <laughs> I don't know how this is going to work out with this infield and the dude they acquired. And, and that, that one blew my mind. That blew my mind. And all these baseball people I respect love that signing and think that was a great shoring up deal for them. With hey, a George. Better. Hey, they George, I just have one question. It's like, damn, shoring up for that money with what you already have on hand? I but we'll George, see. One question. I, I, I do think they're going to do some wheeling and dealing again. And and Chad, you may be right. It may be till the end of July before we find out exactly what the hell is up there, sleep. I have one question. How many days at two o'clock in the afternoon did you look at a lineup with Stuart Fairchild or Kevin Newman in it? I don't want to see that. Like, I don't want to see that ever again. If they go, if Candelario means that I don't have to watch Stuart Fairchild or Kevin Newman That's play, a good point. play baseball ever again, I'm okay with it. Fairchild is still split. they're splits, Chad. They're splits. Fairchild is still going to be your backup left fielder as the roster currently stands. Uh, that's okay. I don't mind him as your 27th guy. I don't want him being. He was in at times last year. He was like the eleventh guy, like on the roster. Like it, you, it, you, you're only like three, two or three injuries away though from that being the case again. That's okay though. I mean, everybody gets these injuries. I mean, that's why know. I'm saying I don't mind them adding a depth piece in the infield, a veteran depth piece in the. Oh uh, no, Basically, I don't either. I just was surprised at the money they paid for a corner guy. Yeah, they uh, replaced Joey Votto. That's what they did. Yeah, yeah, I guess. Um, I don't know if it'll work again. I'm not sure I like how they spent the money, like in overall, right. but they did go spend money. We'll see right. if they cross I mean, the or an idiot. Thought, you know, first base would be a CES steer, you know, whoever, and they've thrown in India on there. Um, I don't know, they're, they're still a little overloaded there, but I'm okay. I'm glad they are because pretty much outside of uh the free agent signing everybody else is at a very 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 team friendly rate right Agreed. well, well that's going to wrap up our george in the jungle bit here again you can find us every tuesday night at nine o'clock where we do it's george and i doing just this talking your cincinnati bengals reds bearcats and uh fc high school sports etc there you go. What one quick thing? The uh, Bearcats in the NFL had to shout out Alec Pierce. Nice fifty-eight yard bomb in the uh, in, in the win for the Colts over the over the weekend. He had a a jersey swap with Trey Tucker after Trey the game. Tucker. So very cool to see that. But uh, Colts fans, they 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 want to see some more deep balls to Alec Pierce, and, and they might they might be able to now that they uh, looks like the Colts are heading to the playoffs. But uh, look, what did we know about that, Alec? Throw it up, he'll go get it. 
Yeah. Yep. Give yeah. him a 50 50 ball and it's a 100 ball. Oh, baby. I love that. And then uh, Drum Ford, man. How about him? He is. Give me a reason to tune into those Browns games, even though, you know, it is what it it's is. It's crazy. Right? It's almost all catching the ball. Yeah, I know. And he never did that here. They didn't right. use him in that capacity here at all. But they are finding ways to get him in space. And when you get him in space, he gone. That, yeah. He Ooh. gone. He knows how to do oh, it. I got to acknowledge that Denbrock guy, questionable sure. offensive coordinator. Bearcat Mick said Charlie Jones had a punt return. He did for a touchdown earlier in the season because I said there weren't splash plays in the special teams. He did do that. There was a flag on the play, but it was on the other team. I always, I always have that flag on the play in my mind, and it goes against the Bengals. That's how <laughs> like PTSD I am on oh. <laughs> negative Cincinnati shit. Of course. Anytime. But it, I remember there was a flag on that. But it was against the opposition. That touchdown's good. Yeah. Fair enough. I, Thanks sure, for the correction. Any dream I have that involves the Bearcats is a nightmare. It's, I know. I, I, I never have good dreams. It's it's crazy. Cincinnati sports for you, Brent. Yeah. Hey, I had a dream they went to the college football playoff once, and it was true. There we go. That was huge. Oh, I like that. Yes. That time stamp brought to you by Quick Paper Supply, your local and family-owned restaurant supply company for all your non-food products. They provide mostly disposable restaurant supplies, to-go containers, cups, pizza boxes, to-go bags, can liners, napkins, etc. They've been open since 2009 and one of the largest minority-owned companies in the city. Call Nick, 513-470-2029 and reference Bearcats for 20% off your first month of purchases. All right, with that, Breathe we are through going it. to open up the mailbag, starting off with the football portion of the mailbag here. Uh, do you think Coach Sat has been underappreciated so far, and should 3-9 be the only measuring stick for his performance? If you look at the new recruiting class and the recent portal additions, as well as the tough conversations he has had to have to reestablish culture, shouldn't we be impressed? Then revisit the fact that it was year one in an environment that had over 20 players either decommit or transfer, if being realistic. Shouldn't we be more outwardly happy with what we are seeing? Well, unfortunately, it comes down to wins and losses, and this fan base has been used to a lot of wins lately. Um, now, do I appreciate what he has done since the end of the season? Hell yeah, no doubt about it. Um, and I enjoy the optimism here. Uh, but you know, I wasn't on board with the whole fire sad. He's got to go. You lost to Miami, you loser. You didn't no. you, you got to give these guys time. You do have to give them time. But I understand the angst after what happened this past season. Um, so, yeah, probably since the end of the season and what, you know, how the sausage is made, no one appreciates that. And, and we'll see what happens next year. Um, but I don't think he's been underappreciated. But I also am not a guy that, that goes for all the fire now stuff. I think it's just, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. So I get the sentiment. Um, but I also understand the fans who are a little rabid about what happened this season. But not all the Here's fans, what, like Killer V, not all the fans stay in tune with what has gone on and who they brought in and who they lopped off the roster. You know, a lot of fans just see wins, losses, and their friend at work says UC sucks or UC's killing it. It is the nature of sports in the social media world, George. People don't have anything smart to say. So they just say the lowest common denominator thing, which is fire everybody. Right. It is. And if we can't fire everybody, this is what always, I mentioned Den Brock a few minutes ago. This is what always fascinated me about Mike Den Brock. You know why Den Brock took heat, George? Why? I, I will stand by this until the day I die. They couldn't say anything about Luke. And they couldn't say anything about Marcus. 
So the trickle down effect was can't say anything about Luke, can't say anything about Marcus. Who's next? Denbrock. And that's why he took the heat that he did. Like, the, I, I believe the 2020 and 2021 teams were the second and third best offenses in program history. And there were people that booed Mike Denbrock coming off the field every Saturday at Nippert Stadium. And, and, and that's what it is. It's lowest common denominator. That's what we have become now that everybody has a voice, quote unquote. Um, they don't know what they're actually upset about because they don't know the game enough to be upset about the right things. So they yeah. just, they have they have to, to point at somebody. We're upset at something. We don't know what it is, but we got to point the gun at some. We got a gun. That's social media, the gun. We got no, a gun. No, no. Truly, truly is, yes. We have to point it at somebody. I don't right. know who, and I, I don't know if it's the right person, but I've got a gun, and somebody's getting shot. And it and makes it feel better when they get shot. Right. If we get demonetized, it's this entire conversation. <laughs> yeah, but that's, but that's what social media is now. It, it, it is. is I've got this voice and I have to use it and I might not know what I'm talking about. And I might, I might not, most fans could not design or diagram. Like they couldn't look at, at a tape and say, this is the concept of what the offense was trying to accomplish, or this sure. is the concept of what the defense is trying to accomplish. So instead, because they can't do that because they're an accountant, not a football coach. Somebody has to be held accountable. I'm yes, mad, pay. and somebody has to be held accountable. Yeah, somebody's got to pay. And at the same time, all that's going on, they don't realize that this dude goes to Notre Dame, to LSU, to Notre Dame. Those are two programs who could probably hire any offensive coordinator in the country. They would have LSU the had means to do it Yeah, if they wanted to, and they, they chose this guy. And this is the guy that was getting pilloried here just a few years ago. So, look, like, that's my honest belief. Some, like, the, the, the default setting is things are not perfect. Somebody must be fired. Right. No. Which, for me, is annoying because it takes away from when somebody should actually be fired. Yes, it does. It that does. has lost all its luster. But here's the other thing. If people didn't act that way, maybe your message boards wouldn't be so active. I'm aware of that. I make money off of it. Like, I'm not. I'm Can not, I just say that? I, I don't not. shut. George, I shut down the threads. I can stop it. I don't because it's good for business. But that's what it is. Like, it's important to know what it is. Oh, man. Where does Trent Cole rank among your best UC defensive players? He's like, oh my God, he's way out there. Oh my God. Top I 10, remember sure. Maybe top I five. remember seeing uh, one of the Bengals personnel in the press box when he was playing. They're like, I'm here to see one guy. <laughs> I'm like, damn, they may really draft this guy. They didn't, and they paid for it. They should have. Would have been a ninth edition for however many long years he was with the Eagles being a, a oh monster. Oh, my God. He was a beast. He was really oh. good at UC, too. He was a standout. Damn. Is there right, any well, chance? There I got any chance George. Trent Cole or Haruki Nakamura? Who you got? Oh, my God. That's tough. I got to pick one. Yeah. I love them both, man. I do, I too. That's both. why I asked. I, That's a tough one. I can't. I mean, I'm a big line guy, so I guess. <laughs> but, I mean, that's tough. Those were two dudes, man. Arisa was there, a great and, interview, too. Great kid. Great yeah. old, old man now. He Boy. shows up all the time, yeah. yeah. Uh, is, is there any chance bowl games would be able to offer NIL to entice players to play? Play. Any thoughts on the discussion around moving bowl games to the beginning of the following season as an opening game to drive player attendance? 
I, I have mentioned the NIL to entice players to play uh, on this network in the past couple of weeks. I think it's what you have to do. I think you have to you have to give them a reason to play in this game. And maybe maybe there will be guys that say that's not enough. But you know what has to happen? You know those people that show up in like uh, ugly jackets uh, to games around the country throughout the season, like and, every NFL player. No, no, like that we have to report. Uh, so and so has uh, the 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 Gasparilla Bowl has uh, three reps in attendance. Oh yeah, those guys. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know what would have to happen if there was NIL involved in bowl games? Those people wouldn't make money anymore. And that's not going to happen. There is an entire cottage industry. They shouldn't be sending these guys around the country during the season. It's a joke. Right. So, yes, that money, and I'm with you, and this is a great question. Uh, We were talking about this last night. You have to have some kind of incentive, and it may be NIL money, that these guys get paid to play in these bowl games. and not worry about this other stuff they're worried about there. It's become a well, joke. And and I love watching bowl games. I mean, holiday season, that's a great – every night there's a bowl game on. And, you know, during this past week, there, there were games on from, you know, 1 p.m. to midnight. It was wonderful. But when you're watching teams that you know and it's like, well, oh, they're missing 12 guys who opted out, it's not the same thing. And they've got to find a way to fix that. I think paying them and giving them an incentive to do it is probably the best way. I don't know about the beginning of the following season. It's a different team anyway at that point. Right. You can't really do that. And it should be a reward for a season well done. It shouldn't be seen as, I really don't want to play in this thing. I mean, I might get hurt and I have a chance to maybe – Signed an NFL free agent contract. It shouldn't be that. Remember in the old days, three years ago, when all we talked about in bowl season was was what was in the uh, swag bag. Yeah. Like, what did the players get? When's the last yeah. time somebody mentioned the the swag room that the players used to go and like and get to shop or like you know? I haven't. Yeah. Here's your PS5. Nobody gives a damn about that ball. shit anymore. No, and that was a big deal. You're right. It, it was, was huge. Deal. Yes. George, you know, it was a story for every bowl game. Right. Here's what the players got. Yep. It, it you, know, you know who does make money every bowl game? The universities. They always make money. That's why they're there. But the Actually, players... no, they don't, Aaron. That's the funny part. Come on. No, 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 no. You're missing my – the bowl game system is set up for the bowl games to make money. Right. And a lot of these bowl games, what happens is, okay, you make this much money, but only if you sell every ticket that we allotted to you, that's the only way you make the money that you are promised for this bowl game. And if you don't sell your tickets, you owe us. Because we are getting, the bowl game is getting their money. That's why the bowl system has not died. Because you have all these bowls that are like, nah, fam, we're not going out of business. Like, And I should know how the TV money works on that. I mean, I think it used to go to the bowl. The bowl has an agreement with whatever TV partner. Yeah. So, no, Aaron, like, I, I, I know exactly where you're coming. The line of thinking is right. But in bowl season, that's not how the bowls work. Like, you get 10,000 tickets to sell, and if you only sell 4,000 tickets, you you lose the money for the 6,000 tickets you did not sell. Right, you pretty much eat it. Right, you have to eat it. You don't have yeah. choice. So that you made one insane. point. Like, they'll say, they'll say this school made $1.2 million. What they oh, won't say man. is they didn't sell $600,000 in tickets so they actually only made six hundred thousand dollars. Now they made six hundred thousand dollars. But when the so Bearcats like, had gone to a bowl game forever, and then they kind of sold their soul to go to that Idaho Potato Bowl, and nobody and went. Whatever they, yeah, and they it cost them a fortune. And then Hugs had to go out to Boise and play. Yeah, 
They did everything. And you know what? Bob, God bless Bob going for doing that because that was the right thing to do for the program. And even if they took a hit, at least got them in a bowl game and got people somewhat interested in UC football back then because nobody was, unfortunately, except, you know, diehards who went there yeah. like, truly. But it was a great move. But, yeah, I'm, I'm sure they took it, you know, they took it up the nose, up the pot. You name the orifice, they took it in there when they so did it's like, the, <laughs> it's like the same as a travel NIT game then. Yeah. Essentially, yeah. Well, I, except, except the home team is the one with the burden uh, in, at the NIT. If you don't sell any tickets, you don't make any money. You mean to tell me the uh, slight chance that you might be able to eat a mascot size pop tart or get a little bit of Duke's mayonnaise poured on you? That's not Ooh. worth it, man. Come on. That, that pop tart was awesome. Oh, hilarious. That was absolutely so hilarious. Fun. That was a you know what? And and that's that's where I'm I love where these bowl games get creative like that. Even the mayo thing. I don't care. Yeah. I mean, people are like, it's kind of funny. And they uh, watered down that mayo, right? Like because yeah, it would it have been would it have been too gross to just dump they real mayo? So, oh, so the I first can't. year that they had the Duke's mayo bowl, they didn't water down the mayo. And it was like just like gloppy, like wow, yeah. I, I think it kind of hurt. I think it was Shane Beamer who it was, kind of hurt him, like hit him hard. <laughs> but now they water it down a little bit, mix it up. That pop tart was hilarious. And then they had that that Cheez Its bowl with that big Cheez Its yep. thing yeah. the they had. And I, 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 coffee bowl, they dumped I, the coffee on the coach. Yeah. It was like awesome. hot. Yeah, it's awesome. It was from McDonald's and he sued. <laughs> right. He got a hundred yeah. million dollars out of it. Oh God! Do you think if they made the award show after the bowl games, like say the Saturday before the Pro Bowl games, would that have an effect of there being less opt outs? No, no. Yeah, I don't think so. Uh, but I do. Like outside of the Heisman, who cares? I think those are already decided. But I do like, kind of like. Um, I kind of like having the award show after the whole shebang there. Um, after the bowl games and all that, because yeah, I, I think a guy can kind of make a name for himself in the playoff. If if they did it right now, Michael Penix would win the Heisman. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. You're right, and you know what? Maybe he should because he's winning important games, um, doing what he's doing. Uh, well, the other guy sat out. Well, then he's out. I mean, Davis didn't even well, play in the game. That's what I'm saying. The while, while the other guy sat out, I'm, that's, right. that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, PDT Bearcat, uh, drop your question next week for Royer. Obviously, he's not here with us tonight. Um, would you see have made more money if Texas had advanced to the final? No. The money that goes to conferences stops uh, after the semis. There is not extra money. That there's goes to the here. conference. There's not a level. There's not another. Now, maybe this changes with the 12 team that's coming. But as it currently stands, the payout to the conferences is for the semis, and there's nothing, uh, nothing for the finals. Did you guys that- get some some uh, PTSD of the of the Big 12 championship game back, back with the back. extra second put back on the yeah, card? The extra second. Saw the, saw the Mac Brown picture on on Twitter like the what's oh yeah <laughs> I, I was wondering the same thing as this question last night um, or yeah last night and that's why I kind of rooted for Texas most of the way but um, but no no extra money uh, one last question here before we though because they made me money in the Pac-12 championship game. hey now here we go why the hell were they getting that many points. What the? Are you kidding me? He went underdogs last night. I mean, it's ridiculous. One last question here in the chat before we move on to the basketball portion. Uh, what does a successful Bearcats football season look like next year? Five wins? Bowl game. Bowl game. Yeah, at least six wins. Right? Yeah. You got three. I mean, it's not going to be easy, non conference, but you got three. Yeah. To get you to you know to the start of Big Twelve play the schedule, it's it's are not you a win against Miami because if you are, I may come through the screen. Have you looked at the transfer portal? Yes, I have. 
I don't care. They are not. They are not losing guys. I'm not counting they, on win. They're not losing guys that they would like to uh, see leave. Ugh. They are losing all of the guys that they would like to stay. You'll be the first guy I hug next year if UC gets the bell back. I wouldn't mind Cincinnati dipping back into the Miami portal and, and grabbing a receiver in there anyway. That's a good point. And, I would rage uh, if that I think happened. you're going to make a lot of money. I might hug Chad then if that happens. <laughs> All right, the basketball portion of the mailbag. What's more likely, CJ driving down the lane and doing a 360 double cock over the head slam in traffic or the Bearcats going 6-0 and to start the non-con? Well, option one to happen. George starting at point guard is more likely. Yes, it is. Um, 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 to me, option A looks pretty good right now. They're not I'm looking at option A. I'm like, what's B? Um <laughs> I if they go six and zero, <laughs> although I will say this, what's more likely? I mean, probably six and zero is more likely. Right. right? Yeah, I mean, okay. say, like, what's like zero percent or point zero one happen? Yeah, that could happen. Point zero one. If they go six and zero, George. If they go six and zero, George and I are CJ's athleticism by any range, but God, that's a funny question. If they go six and zero, George and I are actually going to live do do a live show of George in the Jungle from Clifton burning a couch. Yep, I'll do it. I will. If do they it. go six and zero, I will eat this football. I might eat this sign. Okay, let's let's <laughs> add to it. What should I eat? What should I do? I'll do anything. <laughs> a full BBP with my shirt off. How about that? Bert Kreischer style. Oh yeah. Do the Burke Reiser 5K? Yeah, should, I, should I take it off right now for like good juju? No, no, absolutely not. I'll tee up this cup and hit this <laughs> out of it with my driver. I like this idea. Hey, okay. George, I was thinking we should do that anyway, but hey, just add it to the list. <laughs> if the Bearcats are on the plane coming back from Utah celebrating a glorious W, what will be the single most important reason? A, an un unexpected Bearcat stepped up and scored 20-plus. B, the BYU team players spent too much time with their three wives the night before the game. C, we took care of business on the boards. D, Aziz came back to Utah and had a Utah Valley NIT flashback. E, we played some second half of Evansville game defense. Or F, West read from the Book of Mormon and got into their psyche. <laughs> it's very simple. If UC shoots really well and BYU doesn't shoot really well, there's a chance. Uh, but as it stands, UC has shot horribly away from Fifth Third Arena, and BYU shoots better than anyone uh, playing college basketball right now. So uh, if it if it goes like it says it's going to go, yuck. Uh -huh. If if BYU is the team that shoots 27% from three and UCC shoots 44% from three, then I'm saying there's a chance. See, I thought you were going to say it's very simple. You've already Amazon shipped West the Book of Mormon. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to go with A until I heard that option. Then I'm going with That's... Although the option about the wives was pretty tempting too. Uh, for, for, for you or for them? <laughs> That's so bad. That's so bad. We need to add right. an option of, of just Stetson Dan showing up as well. For, Stetson for, Dan. For, <laughs> Somebody needs there. to make a meme of Stetson Dan. Yeah. Five, like, five Dan. Stetson Dan's on the court at the same time. And we don't want to remember Xavier Dan. Stetson or, da or Dayton Dan or Dayton Dan Dayton Dan no not Dayton Dan no and I'll take you know second half Evansville Dan yeah thanks for that dunk at the end Dan you gave me like a glimmer of like excitement for like it just ripped out your heart he set up ripping out your heart six you need to you need to get Galati on the Stetson Dan T-shirt he's got to give money to Dan so they got to come up with a contract oh so funny. Uh, someone's asking if I saw Thomas 
Jaheen Thomas back in the portal. I did. Um, I don't know what's going on there or what would go on, but like I think he, he, like he was in the wrong position at Arkansas. Like, what does he want to play quarterback? I don't know what's going on here because he had a hell of a year. I think he will be jumping around to his next destination. Yeah, I think so too. I, it's a shame too because he's a player. Well, George, jump around. Jump around. Jump. Oh. Jump. Jump yeah. up, jump up, and get down. Yeah. So he's, he's going, going to. Pick. Yeah, he's going to Wisconsin. Okay. I'd be surprised if he does. I just really hoped he was going to go to Notre Dame and kind of do the thing that all the other former Luke guys are doing. Everybody associated with UC football from 2018 to 2021 is doing. That would have hit me in the field in a good way. And Brock, Gino, Freeman, Chad Bowden, Mike Brown. Mike Mickens. Mike Mickens. You think Weird. how much how much do you think that burns pick up at night? How many of those numbers has he deleted out of his cell phone or blocked? All of them. All of them. <laughs> Don't call me, I'll call you. That's the end of the basketball portion of the mailbag. Moving on to the last portion of the mailbag. Uh, the I don't understand on, this question at all. The week on finding Aaron's limit. I don't know. Uh would you allow Skins to bring you the new NCAA to play right now? Uh, because he's going to try to kill me. No. Um, I'm good on that. <laughs> and also, would you take 10K but never be allowed to play this year's NCAA game? Uh, yes, because there would be another game next year. I've waited 11 years. I can wait another year. No big deal. Yeah, he he, he, he DM'd me because Merck is obsessed with the mailbag. Uh, yeah. Also wanting to know if... Uh, how about if it was the cost of your daughter's wedding? If you said no to the 10K, but uh, he already said yes to the 10K. Yeah, so, yes, 10K. he would also uh, take whatever it would cost for his daughter's wedding to not play the game as well. On this, the day of my daughter's wedding. <laughs> All right, and the last question. Uh, welcome, back. welcome back, George. George, what has been your favorite story that you covered in your career, and why is it Aaron's love of NCAA football 2024? For every, we'll, we'll answer that first. What? What? What, what was your favorite, favorite story st of your career? Oh God, it would probably have to be the Reds in nineteen ninety Reds, baby. Yeah, that was Reds. early in my career. But I'll tell you what, no, I was the Orange Bowl was unbelievable, unbelievable. The Final Four was unbelievable. The playoff was unbelievable. The Bengals Super Bowls were unbelievable. But the happy ending. You know, um, were you at the earthquake? 1990. That red season was magical. Were you at the earthquake? No. No. No, that was a couple of years. That was, it was at the A's and the Giants, right? Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, no, I wasn't out there. I was watching when that happened. That was so bizarre. On the air. Yeah. And there were holy the game. Yeah. an earthquake. And then I think they were in what was it? It was Candlestick Park, they, right? Yeah, they were. That's why it clicked in my brain. They were in Oakland. Uh, that was nuts. What year was that? Eighty-eight, maybe. That was. Yeah, weird. I think I think so. That was so weird. Um, why is it Aaron's all right? Double A football for everyone. Well, disregard that. That was that was a joke, George. Uh, for everyone, grits, yay or nay? Banana hammock and chill. <laughs> Grit. <laughs> Uh, grits, yeah. Stay with us, George. Stay with us. Born one of those. Uh, grits, a shrimp and grits. I like. George, calm down. We're not there yet. Calm down. Uh, easy, fella. Easy, fella. Easy, easy. Good boy. Good boy. Uh, grits. I like shrimp and grits. Like, like South Carolina, Low Country shrimp and grits. I've never been big on just grits. Kelly used to love them with an over easy egg. She'd make the grits and then she'd cut the egg up and the yolk would like flavor it and she would eat that. I don't, that was never my thing. I, I guess I would say no, because I only like one application of grits and that's shrimp and grits. Cheese and grits. I'm, I'm here for grits. I'm here for grits. Yeah. I would like my grits with a side of banana hammock, but. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 
But no, I I'm with Chad though. Grits, hundred percent, gotta be shrimp and grits for me. I'm lukewarm on grits. Very lukewarm. Yeah. Are you warmer on grits or banana hammocks? I'm warmer on banana hammock. <laughs> banana hammock or board shorts at the beach? Board shorts. Is that what it is? Banana hammock or board? I'm board shorts. Yeah. I'm I'm yeah. also board shorts. If I had a hell name, board shorts. hammock. Basically swim trunks. Like 2023 swim trunks or board shorts. Ah. Uh, oh. I'm like brave they're, enough. they're the ones that go that actually go to your knee, though, Brent. Not yeah. the ones that come up to like your just, thigh, upper thigh, just Midway below your bow That's oh that's God. what I wear these days. Those are nice. So Good looks. All right, uh, and the uh, solar panels or wind turbines for Aaron's new energy source at his compound outside Athens. The wind out there says wind turbines, right? Like the wind is like like three quarters of your problem is the wind. Is it wind? If we could harness the wind, you would have no power issues. Except wind turbines are terrifying. Oh yeah, one of, that's nightmares. One of those some bitches falls off, and good luck. I, I remember vividly. We were driving, I think I was driving to Chicago for something at like 19, 20, like very young age. And you get that stretch mm -hmm. where, yeah. and that was the first time I've ever, yeah. that's the first time I've ever seen them in person. And you're just looking at them like, that is some fucked up shit. Dude. Like, these are just out here for miles and miles and miles. The way to understand is how big time. those blades are. They're, I mean, if it's you see them on the highway, they're they're right. very scary. It's scary. George Solar panners panel. Did you ever fight a wind turbine? Oh, oh, hammocks? No, yeah. wind turbines. How Did you big ever fight a wind they're, turbine? They're, they're scary. Well, I came scary. I was gonna show you my banana hammock, but no, uh, hey, hey, <laughs> hey, 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 hey. <laughs> That's Come mailbag, get us out of here, friend. 2024, the year of the hammock. I'm here, man. Lock it in. Lock it in. Out of my head now. What about wind turbines? Wind turbine or solar panel? Probably solar panel. Those turb. I, I mean, I don't know. I'm not sure they're both worth a damn, but those turbines, like half the time, they're not even running. Of course, half the time, the sun's not out either. Yeah. <laughs> it does get dark uh, yeah, every yeah. day. Every day, I got a problem. <laughs> uh, one last time, want to shout out uh, the the George in the Jungle sponsor, Remington Tavern. They can be found eight eight nine two Glendale Milford Road four five one four zero. You can catch me and George on George in the Jungle every Tuesday at nine. Uh, but Remington Tavern does have daily happy hours three to seven p.m. Five dollar Woodford Wednesdays. Instagram, you can follow them at Remy Tav R E M I T A V Cincy with a Y, or follow them on Facebook. Yeah, and, and Danco Joe, you can you can go see him at Danco Transmission, and I don't care. So, so shouts shouts to them, shouts to Remington Tavern, shouts to Quick Paper Supply for for everything that they do for us as well. Um, Anything else, guys? Anything so else? Me if Kenyon was an overall best UC player during my time covering the team, his senior season, without a doubt. Ooh. Without a doubt. His senior season, oh, my God. Unreal. Unreal. I'll tell you what, now that just brought back a bad thought, didn't it? <laughs> Coulda, woulda, shoulda. Todd, I mean, Todd, hey, hey, yep. Yep. Yet another nightmare, George. Yet another nightmare. Never changed, George. They would have. That was the best year I've ever seen out of a player in this city for one one season, his senior year. I mean, he dominated games. He changed games. He won games. I don't know what else you can say. It was incredible. At all. Eric the Red. I'll tell you, his he, he was yes. Jose Rico. <laughs> That's yeah. another one. You're taking me back to that 90 World Series again. Those guys got range, George. Oh, yeah. There ain't no doubt about Chris it. Chris Sabo. Yeah. yeah. 
Paul O'Neill. Yeah. And those those guys are not wearing board shorts when it comes to it. Billy Hatcher. Oh, yeah. what a World Series, huh? One what? of the best ever. Eight for yeah. eight. Started out eight for eight. Yeah, that was Picked crazy. up the slack when Eric lacerated his kidney. Yeah. The fact that, the, you know, they were supposed to get eaten alive by the Oakland A's. And, well, Eric the Red hit that home run in that first inning off Dave Stewart. and My favorite home run of my life. That set the tone. Yeah. He smoked that bad boy, man. Oh, my God. Yeah, and I was sitting and, and he hit it. God, I can't remember if it made the yellow. I think it was the green seats he hit it into. And I was there. Almost that. the yellow. Yeah. Almost the yellow. And those yellows, it was like press overflow. It was right over beside us. And it's like, are you kidding me? This dude just drove one there off the, you know, who was the best pitcher in the game that year? Yep. Best starting pitcher. That was some fun. Those were the days. Yeah, they were, my friend. Now, 88 days. Super Bowl, 90 World Series, 92 Final Four. I'll take another four year like run like that. Years of my career, and then what? I'm like every other year. I'm going to do a big event. This is great. <laughs> and then I sit there and wait, and I wait, and I waited. Really, the the next big event, an ex had made a couple of uh, uh, regional finals, but was probably the Orange Bowl. Yeah. So it was a while between sips of water, but hey, Shout out been good Tony like, can't complain. Shout all out, right, Tony. Kid, what else we got? Nothing. We're out of here. That's all that's, right. that's all we got. We we thank <laughs> that's out of here, we we thank the sponsors. We love you, uh, and of course, um, big game on on Saturday night, 10 p.m. Yeah. The Big 12 season is here. BYU, the Cougs, you know. That's why they play these games because anyone can win. So, so tune in. It, it it could be a fun one. It could really be a fun one. But for my guys, pals, it's been fun doing this crossover. Yes, it has. Weeks. really, really love it. We'll um, have to do it again uh, sometime, like just for the hell of it. Oh yeah, but not here. next Monday because we're no. here live at eight o'clock on Monday. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I we'll see about that. Maybe maybe next Monday at five at five p.m. But. Uh, you know what? For uh, for my guys, pals, partners, crew, uh, Aaron Smith, Chad Brendel, and George Vogel, I am Brent Young. Get another fantastic BBP presented by BearcatJournal.com. See you. 8 o'clock Monday.